Hey, GM. Hi, Charlie and Tim. Is that the graphic for your name? Uh, yeah, that's my, um, the other side is the Chinese characters. Do they have one for Charles? <laughs> of course, there's a character for anything under the sun. What, what are those pictures of? What do you mean pictures of? These your are name. characters, oh. just like first name and last name. Yeah, but it's, does it represent anything? Mm, does your name represent anything? Well, is it I close mean, to any other name. characters in meaning? Tell me what does your name represent? Then I'll tell you what my name represents. Honesty, hard work. Really? Oh, That's yeah. Your first name or last name? What does Charles mean? And then what's your last name mean? Well, the, the first name means, as I said, it means honesty and hard work, okay. intelligence, and trustworthiness. It's the, what you, it's what, what the word is or what you attribute it to? Oh, uh, you don't know. What uh, does your last name mean? Well, we don't list our names graphically. I was just wondering, <laughs> is what's the origin of the graph? Well, every word, whether it's in English or in Chinese, actually originally has a meaning. But then they, uh, people take for granted and lose the, not knowing the name. So the, the family name usually just hand it down and it doesn't really have much meaning. But given name, usually there is a meaning, whether it's in English or Chinese, your parents pick name for a reason. If you don't know, you should ask. So um, either like to um, your family, your grandparents, your relatives, or some, some, uh, wisdom to impart. Um, my given name means a key, like key to a lock, key to mystery, key year, key something actually means very important. No, I actually have studied Hello, the, hello, the hello, written hello. language and the characters. So that's why I was wondering it. What they usually are composite of different. Can you guys things. hear me now pretty well? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm just uh, trying to get this uh, stuff kind of. I was sort of having trouble setting up my network, but it's going to be a little easier. I should have this uh, whole thing pretty much figured out in a second or two here. So, okay. Uh, I know we're still getting a, a chance. Are you ready, Brian, for your uh, presentation tonight? Uh, yeah, I'm <clears throat> ready as I'm going to be. All right. Well, I'm going to be back. I'm up at my mom's house, as you can see, but I'll uh, have a little more, hopefully have a little more uh, microphone here available in a few minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, I'm going to get some coffee. I'll be right back. Well, that's what I'm going to get too. But uh, you're still there, right? Guys, mm -hmm. just I'm going to stick around for a little bit. But you can all hear me pretty well now. Hello, hello, Mr. Steve. Hi, Kim. Good to see you. You can only see the top of your head, which is kind of disconcerting. Well, no, we're going to get that straightened out in no time here in a few minutes. Hopefully we'll have everything straight out here. Unless you don't want to be seen. No, no, no. It's fine. Just a matter of getting the mic, the camera placed properly now. See, I can get it a little better here. I just need a little oomph on the thing. So it's, it'll take a few minutes to get everything going. So, Jan, you're going to give us another talk? I got two dates open the end of September. I'm trying to fill. 
Um, okay. I, um, I'll think about it. Is there some topic you would like me to talk about? Well, uh, whatever you're interested in, uh, you pursue a variety of things. I, yeah. I, I mean, I'm always interested in Asian culture. Uh, okay. I think everyone is some to some extent, you know. Um, working properly. Let me think. Uh, Gianna, why don't you talk about uh, China? Just, just <laughs> about Asian culture. What you can do uh, is. Yeah, I, I, I guess I. The Great guess, Wall of China. What it I, means? I think mo well. The Great <laughs> Firewall. Actually, a more current topic will be uh, China, Taiwan, the U.S. Yeah, it's not sure. my favorite topic to talk about, but I can talk about it. Um, I can talk about uh, there are a lot of uh, politics and misconceptions, but um, I might I might talk about that. Politics. How about something general about like. How growing oh. up in China is different than growing up in the States. <laughs> That's actually a very big topic. Of course, it's different. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, you could follow the growing oh, up, up in you know, Texas. It's very different family, from growing up in family. New York. I'm gonna I mean, back, I'm going to be back in less than a minute or two, okay, guys? I'll be right up back in a minute. Sure. So. Just Go. keep going. It's a pure old man. So uh -huh. if I ask you a question about cultural values, what what can you name of three American cultural values? The American dream. What is American dream? It's American dream. Yeah, if you work hard, America, you'll get ahead. Or, or is it you work hard, you get ahead. Yes, but Education isn't that is universal? It? at universal. That's not anything America about it. Work hard to, and you succeed in education. That's actually universal. It's not America. No, no. If people came here, they thought the streets were paved with gold. Wow. That's just that's where they came. They that's came here. Propaganda. They picked that's, up and moved no, here. That's not, true. here. that's not true. You have a big difference. That's you no, know, that's not accurate. So what do you think yes, that our culture that is that is different from other cultures? They're Americans by choice. Totally different you type were of church. born in this country, you didn't choose. You if you were born in Mexico, you would be a Mexican. I grew up in an immigrant family. Yeah, but you didn't choose to be in the States. You were born in the States. Well, I, in my parents' values were immigrant values. My grandfather, actually. But yeah, they so, made a conscious choice. Of, but you, you know, didn't. questions I asked, but you, why did they come to the States? No, that's not, um, I, my original question was, what can you think of that's unique American values that are different from other countries? Working hard to education actually is Chinese values. Maybe they're not no, different no. from other countries. They're Nobody not better than any Americans. countries. Okay. Nobody okay. works harder than Americans. That's not they true. Really a lot of people Americans. working harder than American Chinese people. A lot of most Chinese people actually working harder than Americans. The Americans put in more hours than that, anybody else. That's not really. Nobody gets less for their money than Americans. That, that's that's not the that's not the, the key difference. That's the universal. People everywhere well, will start to make a living. Guns, guns, that's, guns. That's guns, guns, guns. That's the American value. No, in, in Europe they think it's status quo. You're born in a station. There's no upward mobility concept. You're entirely that's, wrong in that's that regard. Only, that's only conditioned by time, a certain time and certain population. Not no, not at all. Talk to the Brits, man. You haven't. You still haven't touched upon the most important. In Britain, you got to be of the manner born. 
That's why Americans came here. Came here because they they were tired of that that stratification system. George Washington, in particular, hated it. Okay. Yes, yeah. they really did. They were they had a totally different perspective. Okay. Uh, and it changed, even got more more deeply. <coughs> the forefathers were afraid that the mob would take over even that's you know the commoners <laughs> yes like george washington tried to get in the british army but he would never be raised up in ranks because he was not of the right lineage he was a good soldier and that's why he had no use <laughs> for the british army so maybe I'll talk about cultures and values and how in what to what extent some values are uh, cross culturally shared and some uh, unique. That could be an interesting topic. I, I think Americans are also a highly mobile population. They think nothing of moving. Mobile in terms of geographic or in terms of social class? Both, but in particular geography. Comes from a frontier concept. These other countries don't have frontier concepts. Like Abe Lincoln is a hero. He's a guy, you know, chopped wood and all that. They like Abe Lincoln. You gotta look at the heroes. Who do you find who's heroic? You know. That's better, isn't it, guys? There we yeah. go. You can see my head now a little more, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you got a haircut. I was gonna say, yeah, you... yeah, well, it's also calling uh putting a network up uh <clears throat> crazily. You can hear me, can't you? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm at my mom's house and moved in last week. Oh, my. Huh? I didn't know you were going to do that. No, I'm living with her now, so we're uh, kind of just uh, getting set. On, uh, I, that's why I, I didn't come in last week to the college. I was moving because I had an entire dumpster where the stuff we moved out of here. Yeah, it's <laughs> moving is pretty disorienting. I, well, I, I, <laughs> I feel well, your pain, as they say. Mm -hmm. I'm See, still Jan, I told you. It's been a year. <laughs> See, Jan, I told you Americans move all the time. And not after 33 years, Charlie. Hello, Jan. How you doing? Doing all right. Well, how about everybody else? Hiya. We're good. Hi, Steve. We're good to go. Okay, good. Well, we got everything working fine now, I guess. It's my family is 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 doing that. Tomas moved to Spain, and now he got a job in Seattle. So he's moving from Spain back to Seattle after a year, and then who knows how long he's going to stay in Seattle. Well, you know, that's good. Yeah, except I wish he was able to stay in Spain. It's really a beautiful place. Really, you like it, uh, the rain and yeah. sky. It's mainly I mean, in Kentucky huh? is a beautiful Sounds place. Good. I've gotten a good <laughs> fellow Turner Classic movies. Kentucky. Kentucky. Okay, wait a second. I'm, I I missed what what. Uh, Jan said. Hey, well, well, it doesn't matter. He was walking. He was. He lives in Badalona, which is a little, which is like a a a, a small city that's just north of Barcelona, and because the population is so dense there. People don't need to use cars because they've provided public transportation for people. There's buses all night every 15 minutes and a, and trains all night every 15 minutes. And he's got train stations like within three, two different train stations within, or two, on two different train lines within three blocks of his house in one direction and the other. And uh, he was at midnight there now because that's what time it is there. Um, or when he called me and there were people on the street and everybody's hanging out and 
nobody's worried and you know it's just there there isn't the crime and there isn't the the uh or where he is anyway there and i i don't know what it's like in other parts of spain but and and there are problems there but what he spends for health care is about 10 percent of what he spends here the full cost of wow of what he uh, does wow. what he needs to do is is 10 percent of what it is here and because even and he doesn't even have insurance there it's just what it costs there yeah. and so that, much lower, that much lower huh oh yeah oh yeah we have the highest health care in the world highest cost health care in the world I believe in the world and it doesn't cover and the worst and the worst yeah and the worst outcomes yep well i'm not sure about the worst outcomes but definitely the worst coverage anyway so um well casper and iphone user and eliana van and glad to see you already you so he's, he's on now. He's on the beach and they have a beach there because it's on the Mediterranean and um, it's just it's the next town north from Barcelona, but it's still on the beach and Barcelona is um, a um, port city, an old port city and um, and they're going to go to Tarragona, which is an old Roman town uh, tomorrow on a day trip. So that will be nice. So. <laughs> They just have, because they just go into Barcelona and, and they have connections to everywhere in Spain. So that's great. That's great. Okay. If you guys are ready to get started, uh, can you hear me pretty well? I hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. I don't know. All right. All right. Uh, let's get started with the College of Complexes. All right. Um, all right. We're going to start the recording. All right, welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody here to our illustrious uh, gathering. There are two rules of the college. One is one fool at a time. Second is no personal attacks. And tonight we're gonna have Brian go ahead and give me his version of uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the college consists of the following format. The first one is there's a brief announcements period. Then Brian will get in and do his presentation. Then we'll have our questions and answers. After our questions and answers, we'll then have our uh, infamous rebuttal period where you'll be able to uh, rebut the speaker. So with, without further ado, Charlie, if you're ready to uh, get started here, we can get started here. I'll uh, get ready and... Uh, Share the screen when you're ready to go with the Zoom, with the Zoom stall. All right, welcome to meeting number 3,679 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. <laughs> First of all, as usual, I gave an advertisement for, uh, we have a Google group that uh, you can join very quickly and easily in the center of our main website. Or we also have a meetup group that functions in much the same fashion. You'll get maybe one or two uh, updated emails on the topic for the coming Saturday presentation. Uh, very little traffic. Uh, okay, yeah, we got that out of the way. Uh, although I am not a capitalist, uh, although I'm not a cap, yeah, though I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for, next week's for our upcoming programs. Okay, next week, August the 20th, we're going to take a look at the Green Party, Illinois, USA, and the world. And it'd be like a green guide to voting. We'll cover the Illinois Green Party oh. platform. Briefly, 10 key values uh, and many, many aspects uh, of environmental and ecological activities that influence public policy. This is, we got a pretty nifty PowerPoint put together and there should be several veteran ILGP Green Party members 
uh, joining in and help to answer your questions. <laughs> so see you all next week. Tell your friends uh, not to miss this one. On August the 27th, the Citizens Utility Board will be talking about installing community solar in your neighborhood. So you and your pals, your neighbors, um, can put together, become your own electric utility. So information on how to undertake doing that should be an interesting program. Um, on, on September the 3rd, a special Labor Day speaker will be yours truly. I'm going to be looking at the history of the factory and how we came to live, uh, how we came to work in them and how we came to live in a factory made world. <laughs> That's that's where we're at, folks. So this would be a good one. Covers many, many facets of life in the United States from a historical perspective and going back with the onset of the Industrial Revolution. So that's uh, September the 3rd. On September the 10th, we're going to look at the philosophy anxiety. The philosophy anxiety. Anxiety is fear of the unknown, <laughs> which I think many of you manifest this uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know what I, symptom. Okay, uh, September 10th is the uh, philosophy of anxiety. This guy's given lectures at the Newberry and so forth on this. Should be a good one. Uh, our next open dates then. Um, or September 17th and the 24th, rounding out September uh, for the, this period. Anyhow, that's it, Tim. Thank you very much. Take it away. Okay, uh, Brian, if you're ready to speak, go ahead and speak. <clears throat> All right. So, so can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm Brian Dennehy. Um, uh, so, so I am an I am an attorney. I went to law school. I took the bar exam. I passed the bar exam. Um, I'm also a LLM. I have a master's of law in taxation, uh, and I also am licensed to practice law in the province of Alberta, Canada. Um, so I have a lot of education. <clears throat> I know a lot of stuff. Um, can, constitutional law is not my forte. It's not my expertise. I did take the class in law school as we're all required to do. And so what I wanted to do is kind of go through what some of what we learned in law school and then to see how that applies in our world today. Like when we hear about, you know, the federal government, thanks. Uh, so, so to be clear, I am not offering legal advice. I am not offering legal opinions. I am not acting as your attorney. I, I am <laughs> discussing these matters as an academic pursuit, as an educational. It has nothing to do with the practice of law. I am not representing you. I am not giving you legal advice. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So, <clears throat> so what I wanted to do is kind of go through what, in, in my opinion, is probably the, the, the operative section of the constant of the U.S. Constitution, and and that it'll probably be a surprise to you when when you kind of think about everything that Congress does, and you think about the limits of its powers, the limited and enumerated powers of Congress. Like when you think of all the laws that Congress passes, under what constitutional provision does Congress derive that power? So I, I'll show you. Um, so can I share my screen? Yes, you can. Okay. Should be just available and open for you. Okay. <clears throat> so can you, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. What okay. a small print. Well, all right. So <laughs> this is, this is the constitution. I'll, I'll scroll to make it bigger. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, 
section article one all right that's article one section eight is the the powers of congress <clears throat> So lay taxes, borrow money, regulate commerce, establish, you know, all this stuff, right? So when Congress passes laws, which one of these would you think that Congress relies on the most? And almost every time, it's this one. Section eight. Three, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among um, the several states and with the Indian nations. Almost everything that Congress does is based on this clause. And that's because almost any human activity can be related and tied to commerce in some way. So when people say, you know, America is a democracy, that it's, you know, winner take all, majority rule, our representatives vote, and they have the authority to just decide to do whatever they want to do because America is a mob rule democracy. America is not a mob rule democracy. It is the broad interpretation of this clause that leads people to think that Congress's power is unlimited because of the way this clause has been interpreted. Now, so, and so I'll provide a real life current example of how that happened. Of, of this. So you all know the, you know, the federal government, uh, they pass this red flag law, Still there. Know, the house, the federal red flag law, federal extreme risk protection order act of 2021, right? So what constitutional authority that they're relying on? Right here, article one, section eight, clause three, the commerce clause. So you might ask yourself, <clears throat> You know, how does how does regulating commerce mean that the the federal government can deprive people of their liberties and property? Well, because, you know, guns are sold in interstate commerce. That's why. So when when it comes to when you come to reading the Constitution about the Second Amendment, you know, the the Congress's position would be that they have the power to regulate firearms because they're sold in commerce in the inter in interstate commerce. And therefore there's a balancing test that has to apply okay. where the, the power, the, the power of Congress has to be measured against the deprivation of liberties to the individual. Right. So, so because of that broad interpretation you know, people get the mistaken idea that Congress has the power to do whatever it wants, and it doesn't. It has it limited and enumerated powers. We are not a, a, a mob rule, 51 percent, mm -hmm. and you can do whatever you want, democracy. You know, the power of the, the federal government, the power of the states is limited um, because of this idea that, that people have unalienable rights to, you know, it's in, a, it's in the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> right, y'all know these. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That means like they're they're self-evident. You like you don't even need to talk about it. That all men are created equal. They're they're down by the creator with certain unalienable rights. That means rights that are not given and that cannot be taken away. So certain unalienable rights: of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And that to secure these rights, government are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Okay, so so when you think about consent, what does that mean to you, right? I mean, consent means that I agree. And, and if I don't agree, but something is being imposed on me, even though I don't agree, I'm acquiescing. I'm not consenting, I'm acquiescing. What I'm saying is that, you know, I recognize, you know, the validity or, or superior force of the law, and therefore I am acquiescing even though I don't consent. So our system of government, as we see it today, is more about that government derives its just powers from the acquiescence of the masses, because you know, the the government just they just do whatever they want. I mean, they pass these laws. They know they're they know they're probably unconstitutional, and they they do it anyway, and, and then you know subject the process. You know, 
the person to this process of trying to prove that the law is unconstitutional as applies to them or that it's unconstitutional as written, which is very, very hard to do. Uh, you know, I mean, it, laws are presumptively constitutional. So, you know, when you're an individual whose rights are negatively affected by some law, you have an uphill battle trying to say that, you know, it's unconstitutional as, <clears throat> you know, as written or as it applies to me. I mean, you're facing an uphill battle because every law enacted by the legislature is presumed valid. And, and, you know, and there's good reason for that, right? I mean, you can't really have a functioning government where, you know, the law isn't presumptively valid, right? I mean, you know, you have to presume that the law is valid, but it does create this, this situation for individuals in which their rights are, are violated. There really isn't, isn't much recourse. You can't really, you know, politicians claim sovereign immunity. It's very difficult to, to try to collect. If they pass some law that violates your constitutional rights, you're, you're going to be hard pressed to, to collect from them. Um, so, so, you know, so that's kind of the, you know, the, the, you know, the premise, the foundation, right? So, you know, Charlie, when, when he asked me to do this, he brought up, you know, the kind of three cases, the recent Supreme Court decisions related to, um, you know, the, uh, you know, handgun licensing in New York, in New York state and abortion rights. And then how the, the powers of the EPA were curtailed. So, uh, so I did look at those cases. Those cases are very long. They're very dense. And so I, I kind of looked at the summaries. I did not go through the cases in detail. I'm not trying to. I'm not. I'm not giving legal opinions about those cases. So, you know, I. But I. I will kind of talk about them from the from the perspective of, you know, the rights of the individual versus the the political authority of of the government in this case. So, um. So I have the. I have the cases here. So, this is the what is this case? Yeah, Dobbs first. So this is the abortion case, right? So abortion is not what what the Supreme Court said is that the abortion is not a, a protected right. It's not a fundamental right. It, it's not. Um, it, it Congress hasn't passed a law uh, protecting abortion. That Roe versus Wade was a judicial doctrine that's been in effect for 50 years, but has never been passed into law by Congress. So the Supreme Court said, basically said, they applied the, the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment, what, what it does, and, and you can read it. There's a this, this thing. See, you guys made, now the words are too big, <laughs> but, uh, oh yeah. So it's on, it's on another page, I'll find it. But so, so the 14th amendment basically applies certain amendments to the states saying that, you know, even though the federal government can't do this and states, you can't either. And so the, the 14th amendment does, it applies certain amendments like the first and, and, uh, the fifth and the fourth, it it's, tells the states you can't pass laws that violate these rights either. So, um, so under the Fourteenth Amendment, you know what the if the federal government, if Congress hasn't enacted legislation, then presumably the states can enact legislation, and abortion is one of those issues. Congress has not acted, and so. You know, in, in traditional federalist terms, you know, the role of the federal government versus the state that that matters of health, welfare, police, education are left to the states and not to the federal government. So so to that extent and and they found that under the Ninth Amendment, which. Um, <clears throat> where's the Ninth Amendment? See, it's ah, they make it so hard to read this stuff. But. So the Ninth Amendment. It's on your left, Brian. Just scroll up. Yeah, no, I got it. So, so the Ninth Amendment is this. 
the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So what the Ninth Amendment basically says is, is this kind of covers that, that unalienable rights. It is, is what it says is that, you know, because Congress was, you know, empowered to do certain things, it doesn't deny or disparage the rights of the people to, to do others. So the, you know, Roe Ro versus Wade was, was, you know, initially founded, you know, or <clears throat> decided based on some kind of privacy right, that there's, there's a privacy right inherent in the Ninth Amendment that, you know, says that it's, a, it's an unalienable right and therefore it cannot be legislated. So at, at least that's my understanding of it. <clears throat> so, so the Supreme Court said, well, since Congress hasn't legislated, it's left to the states and the states can regulate abortion. So there you go. I mean, it's, it's the way things are. And you may think, you know, this is outrageous. Uh, you know, I have a right to get an abortion. Well, no, you don't. No, you don't. You don't have a right to get an abortion because, because the state can take that right away. I mean, that's the way it goes. You know, or at least that's the way things are interpreted. That, that these, you know, these unalienable rights that we don't have unalienable rights. I mean, it, it's, you know, the Legislators Act, those laws are presumptively valid. We're all affected by them. And until they're overturned by a court, then these unconstitutional laws remain in effect. So, you know, and, and when you think you have a right, like the right to get an abortion, it, it probably comes as a surprise when you find out, oh my God, I don't have a right to an abortion because the state can take that away. So, you know, so, so, you know, your unalienable rights, I mean, you question which, you know, how, how is the concept of unalienable rights reflected in our current jurisprudence and, and interpretation of the constitution and the rights of the people versus the power and authority of the government. So, so I, I think a good way to kind of illustrate this, and this is, you know, so, that, so there's another case, you know, NRA versus Bruin, and you know, again, I didn't read the case. Only a cat owning bitch would complain to the police about a fucking joke. Fine, you're upset you lost your cat. Fair I'll enough. Yeah, the joke may have been a little bit, you know, risque. Who calls the police on a fucking joke? Cat owners. Cat owners are liberals. Cat owners believe in hate speech. Cat hey, owners so are Democrats. Can you stop this? Cat owners are dickheads. I'm trying to do right now. Okay. I'll get him out of here. Yeah. So. So if, if you see the holding in the case, and, and so the basic, the basic gist of it was this, is that New York passed some law that said that, you know, you had to have proper cause to be issued a license to own, to carry a firearm. You had to, you know, show cause as to why you needed to exercise this right. And so what they said was that, it, it, it violates the 14th Amendment by preventing law-abiding citizens with ordinary self-defense deeds from ex exercising their Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms in, for self-defense. So, the so here this you know they apply this um, you know means and scrutiny. So so. What the what the Supreme Court has basically done in courts and the way that they decide these constitutional issues is is this through this balancing test, right, where they they balance the the compelling interests of the state against the rights of the individual, and depending on you know the the restriction that the law puts on individuals, that that the courts would apply a level of scrutiny to the statute, and say. You know whether it's um, you know strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny or or some kind of rational. It's rationally related to a compelling government interest. So so what you what you'll find if you read through case law is that the court almost always finds that there's compelling government interest, and, and it's this whole idea, right? Is that you know the government can just you know, politicians, they want to, they want to support their law. And it's like, you know, compelling, a compelling government interest. Well, you know, so in this case, you know, with these, you know, with gun rights, you know, 
it, so the politicians will they'll always cry you know about <clears throat> safety 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 all these shootings we got we have to take people's guns away this is terrible right so they'll always be able to justify <clears throat> some restriction bodybuilding is a beauty pageant where dudes try their best to put on muscle so other dudes can say you're the best looking dude it's gay it's super gay i said tell them it's gay all the time it's not gay it's hard work dedication blah 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 so I, I, so I, so they apply this test right and and they almost always can can justify it so and then the the last one that he asked me to look at was this west virginia versus the epa and again i didn't read this case i'm not offering you a legal opinion on it i'm simply discussing it for education and discussion purposes all right so so basically you know the the facts of this case very generally the the epa has this these rulemaking procedures where you know they're they apply tests to the you know the, that you know in order to meet their standards the epa provides tests and, and tells people what they have to do to meet these standards so the epa they they changed the test they expanded it and so the court said whoa you know by expanding your powers you are taking authority away from Congress. It is Congress that has the authority to make law, not you. So the Supreme Court said no. And, and since Congress hadn't given them that specific authority, they referred it back to the states. Let the states deal with it because health, safety, education, policing, these are, you know, these are matters that are properly within the purview of the states. So, you know, as I as I kind of think about the the result and the rationale of these decisions, I think this is, I, you know, that the Supreme Court is doing what it should be doing. That it's it, that it's restraining the the power of Congress to just do and, and then and, and administrative agencies to just do whatever they want. So, you know, and and, and in these cases. They did they did something else, something else that's significant. So so it is that what the Supreme Court is doing it is that they're in the process of, of making these cases. They're also creating a new test for to evaluate whether a law is constitutional. So let me find the uh well so i, I don't like wet so, the so floor, the gist of it panties is are all wet you go fucker that's how it goes slap slap grab choke shut up bitch sex <laughs> he's out of here he's gonna be <clears throat> yeah <laughs> so oh damn it okay where is it right about that yeah so let me you can see the test that the Supreme Court is applying here. Let me find it. Uh, so so the Supreme Court kind of they out they they describe a test to evaluate the uh, you know a constitutional you know a, a statute or a constitutional right. So it says the court examines whether the right to attain an abortion is rooted in the nation's history and tradition and whether it is a component of ordered liberty. So what the court is doing in this with this is it's basically outlining a new test that that comes in addition to or as a supplement to their their you know, it'll kind of get flushed out over time. But this this idea that where the government has a, a compelling state interest to do something, that that's the end of the constitutional scrutiny. So, so you know, in, in this sense, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I have a certain skepticism about this test, you know, because, you know, America's history and tradition, you know, women were not afforded the you know, the right to vote until women's suffrage in the 19, 1920s and black right. Americans. I mean, they they were denied the right to vote until like 1970. So, you know, if you kind of 
look at America's history and traditions, you know, I could see, you know, states, you know, perhaps being able to justify some things that seem pretty heinous, um, you know, if they look back and, and evaluate their laws from like 1858 or something. Yeah, I, I believe the way that the Supreme Court is working this is that the 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 14th Amendment didn't come in until I believe 1865. And so they're looking at, you know, cases or laws that were in existence from 1865 forward. But, you know, 1865 forward, you had segregation, women did not have the right to vote. And so when you consider the laws that would have been in effect in 1865, 1870, you know, that certainly those laws would not have reflected the opinions of women or, or people of, of, you know, Black Americans or you know, other people that were denied access to the to the right to vote. You know, so so I, I think as there's kind of talk in the news about what's happening with the Supreme Court and what they're doing, the concern is, I think, this test. But I, I can say this, that without this test, without some way to, to rein in and question the authority of the government to do what they're doing, because if, you, if we were to rely solely on this compelling government interest test, that there is almost always a compelling government interest to be found. And so when, you know, which means that basically every law is going to be found unconstitutional you know, or most laws are going to be found, you know, constitutional, and that, you know, it's difficult to overcome the hurdle that your rights were violated. So to, to demonstrate this, to show you exactly what I'm talking about, I'm going to use the red flag laws, because I absolutely despise the red flag laws. The red flag laws are so such an abomination to the, to the concept of individual liberty, that I, I, I cannot see how this is law and how it is has been found to be constitutional. So um, so let's see. So if you see here, and this is this is just you know Cornell Law School, they say, so, Due process clause prohibited court from hearing a case that could adversely affect a party's interest unless that party has been given proper notice. To satisfy this notice must be reasonably calculated to inform all interest is pending and that it could affect their interests, right? So that's due process. And, and then here again, there's kind of, this is kind of judici or, or justia, and they talk about, you know, due process requirements. So due process, historically, and in my, my learning of it, it requires notice and an opportunity to be heard. So what are the minimum due process requirements that, are, you know, that a person must be subjected to or be afforded before the state can deprive them of their, their rights, their, their liberty, their property? So a notice and an opportunity to be heard. That is basically the, the standard for due process requirements. But in the case of the red flag law and temporary restraining orders and emergency orders of protection, people's rights are taken away from them without notice and an opportunity to be heard. And, and so if you look at, let me try to try to find the case. All right. So this is a Florida case. <clears throat> I am not licensed as an attorney in Florida. I am not giving anyone legal advice about any laws in Florida. I am discussing this case for education and discussion purposes. Okay. So, so this this case here, this is a, a a Florida appeals court case that decided the the constitutionality of Florida's red flag law. So. So the case here, the facts are very, which was passed after the Parkland shooting. So, um, so the case here is very good facts to uphold the, the, 
the constitutionality of this law. So the facts are basically that, you know, the guy who was accused of being dangerous or, you know, presenting eminent, you know, a danger of eminent harm to himself or others was seeing a mental health professional. He had been diagnosed. He expressed that he was willing and capable of committing acts of violence against other people. So the facts lined up that this person was demonstrating all, he had all the indications of someone who, who had the potential to be dangerous. So, and they issued this extreme risk protection order uh, in, in an ex parte hearing. Now, when they say ex parte, what that means is that the person who is who's having their rights taken away is not afforded notice and an opportunity to be heard. They don't even know it's happening. So, so with these red flag laws, the way this is working is that the police will, you know, get some, somebody will come in, you know, a family member, they'll tell them that, you know, so-and-so is dangerous. He's going to hurt himself. He's got a gun. And then the police will, will or the, the family member can go to a judge and they can recite the facts, at which time the judge will make a determination and this extreme risk protection order will be issued. The person who is the subject of that extreme, they'll find out that their rights were taken from them when the cops show up and hand them this order. So, so when you talk about substantive due process, right? Notice and an opportunity to be heard. The presumption of innocence. Shouldn't, shouldn't people be afforded the presumption of innocence before their rights are taken from them? Well, yeah, now the law says they, that that's not required because the state has a compelling state interest in taking that right away because of all those dangerous criminals out there who might be getting it ready to shoot somebody up. You know, so, so, so everybody loses that presumption because the state decided that they have a compelling state interest in being able to take away people's firearms for those who they they deem to be dangerous or you know risk of eminent harm to someone else. So this person right here, you can see it, issued a temporary ex parte risk protection order. So the person they weren't there. They didn't know this was happening. So so if you think about that, just think about that from a from a basic, you know, what you think about liberty and, and, and your individual rights. I mean, the presumption of innocence, right? I mean, don't we have that? Don't we don't we have the the right to, to know what we are being accused of, the right to confront our accusers, the right to appear and ask questions, to present evidence? Well, these extreme risk protection orders, these red flag laws, they, they dismiss all that stuff because the state has a compelling state interest in taking people's guns away. This is very, very important. So, you know, so and, and, and so here, here's the case. I'm not going to read it all. But so here it is like due process. You know, appellate asserts two instances of denied due process. And so here he's the, the court even says. Although due process requires each party have a reason op reasonable opportunity to prove or disprove allegations. Once trial proceedings have commenced, it becomes a come blah, 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 blah. So, so due process requires each person to have a reasonable opportunity to prove or disprove allegations. Well, if you're not there and you don't know what's happening, you don't know what evidence is being presented. You don't know what's being said. How are you given a, a reasonable opportunity to prove or disprove allegations? You're not even there. So, I mean, it, but here, here again, I mean, we see, right, that the court upheld this, this statute. And, and how it upheld it is basically that... Where is it? Yeah. So our essential tax ta task is to focus on the text of the statute, not a specific application. And the challenger must demonstrate that no set of circumstances exists in which it can be constitutionally valid. Right. So it falls on the the defendant. It falls on the respondent 
you know, so here's a person whose rights are taken away from them, and then it falls on him to prove that the, the statute is unconstitutional, right? And he was unable to do it. So, so, you know, this is like the way these laws are are being interpreted, right? I mean, that the legislature has this authority that laws are presumptively, you know, um, valid, that it can lead to results like this. And, and you know, I know that that you know the way the way in which you know these issues are talked about is they don't really talk much about the reality the reality that these take place that these findings take place in a hearing in which the accused isn't present and they and they they rationalize it the courts rationalize it by saying that it's not a final order your rights you're not deprived of your rights until you're permanently deprived of your rights so that period of time you know in which you know a person shows up at a hearing that you don't even know is happening and you lose your ability to possess a firearm or you lose your ability to do you know any number of things because these these you know emergency orders are common they're used all the time and you know with under the same rationale like a big a big use of emergency orders is in is it you know in cases of uh, suspected domestic violence which often leads to or is a part of a custody case so what often happens is that you know at the start of a of a custody dispute you know wife or husband will go and, and seek an emergency order of protection in order to get the other spouse out of the house that you know the, the person's dangerous so 14 days that the person who's accused they have no say their rights are just gone and, and and then there's the finding that they're dangerous at a hearing that they're not even present at and, and then and then they have to go back to court so so if you look at the way you know so they say you know 14 right 14 days you get your rights back <laughs> okay so 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 this is this is John Adams arguments for for the defense and John Adams like this was from a hearing in which he was representing the British soldiers who committed the Boston massacre and, and so what he says is and I'll, I'll make the text bigger <clears throat> so we are to look upon it as more beneficial that many guilty persons should escape unpunished than one innocent person should suffer. The reason is because it's more, it's of more importance to the community that innocence should be protected than it is that guilt should be punished. For guilt and crimes are so frequent in the world that all of them cannot be punished. And many times they happen in such a manner that it is not of much consequence to the public whether they are punished or not. But when innocence itself is brought to the bar and condemned, especially to die, the subject will exclaim, it is immaterial to me whether I behave well or ill for virtue itself is no security. And if this sentiment as is should take place in the mind of the subject, there would be an end to all security whatsoever. So, so when you think about this, these issues in, in the context of, is it better to let 10 guilty men free than to convict one innocent man, a principle upon which American jurisprudence is founded? When, when these very basic concepts of liberty, that of, of unalienable rights have been taken to the point where the, 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 the legislature and the courts can rationalize almost anything, then, then what rights do we have? We have no rights. So, so to the extent that the Supreme Court has, you know, is rolling out a test to, to try to, you know, kind of reformulate some of these, these rules in which we're, where you look at the constitutionality of statutes that, I, you know, frankly, I'm all for it because I, I look at what we're doing and I, and I think to myself, this is, this is unbelievable. 
I, I mean, I, I can't believe that. So, so you talk to some of your lawyer friends, I'm sure you, you have some, and ask them if they practice in the air, area of family law. You know, I had a, I, I talked to a colleague who works in the, you know, domestic, um, domestic relations, and, and he sought an, or, an emergency order of protection in one of these ex parte hearings. And he said in 40 of 41 cases, it was granted because no judge wants to be the guy who, de who denies somebody this emergency order and then have something terrible happen. So, so the incentive, right, in, in the mind of the judge, right, because it, you know, protect the public. That's what he's thinking. And so when presented with this option, it is you can temporarily take away this, this person's rights and preserve the public interest, it, you know, then it, under, under the rationale that those rights will be restored to them in 14 days. Well, from a judge's perspective, it's, it's certainly easier to grant the order and, and, you know, have a temporary restriction on a person's rights than to have something terrible happen and, and to be the person, you know, who, who may be held responsible for it because you didn't, you, you denied the person they relief, the relief they were seeking and now they're injured. So, so, you know, as, as I consider, you know, kind of American jurisprudence and where we are as a, as a country, um, you know, I got to say, I, I, I'm a little concerned, you, you know, the, the, <laughs> the way in which our rights are, are taken from us, things that we hold dear, things that we value, or at least I, things that I think we should, right? The presumption of innocence, the presumption of innocence, right? So, so, I mean, here's the thing, right? So, you know, I copied the, so this is an informational brochure from Florida about how to get one of these risk protection orders. And we have the same laws. That, I don't know that the law is identical, but this was, this was what the, the, the federal law was based on. I, actually, I don't, I don't know if it's law yet, but I think it's passed the house. So I, I don't, actually, I think they passed that. So, <clears throat> but it, so here, once an order of protection has been entered, right? So this is entered in a, in a hearing in which the person isn't present, the accused isn't there, right? So the respondent may make a written request to have a motion to vacate the order at the hearing. The respondent, the person accused has the burden of proving by clear and convincing evidence that the order should be vacated. So let's think about this, right? So order is granted in which person isn't there. They don't know. They have no chance to respond, no chance to present it, nothing, right? They don't know what's said. So then order's entered. Now it's up to that person, the person who, whose rights were taken in an ex parte hearing in which they had no notice or opportunity to be heard. And now the burden is on them to prove why they should get their rights back. I mean, does that sound right to you? I'm just saying, right? Like, just, you know, like basic concepts of, of you know, justice and fair play. You know, so, so, and then, you know, I have, you know, one more thing and it's this, right? Government to enforce mandatory anal probing. Oh my God. That doesn't sound right. Holy cow. Oh, well, it's necessary to save lives. Oh, God. Thank God. Thank God. It's all good then. So, um, so that, that's, that's it. That's all I, that's all I have. Um, so I, I welcome any questions. I don't know if, um, okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. I guess you can. Okay. okay, I'll show you. Okay, good. We're good. Okay. All so, right. My first question is this. Um, and we'll we'll take questions as they come up. Um, you mean to tell me that if a guy's got a bunch of AK-47s like my loony neighbor, and he threatens somebody, 
you're telling me that I can't go to a judge and not you you wouldn't support me going to a judge and getting him to take away his guns for a while. Okay. <clears throat> He's threatening you? Well, let me ask you this. Why isn't that an assault? Good point. Good point. I, I mean, so so accuse him of a crime because assault doesn't require actual physical harm. It, it, the the reasonable apprehension of eminent physical harm. That's what um, assault is. He doesn't have to touch you. If he threatened you with his firearms, you can have him pr prosecuted for assault. So, or you could go to the police. So why do you, why do we need this law? Why do you, why do they need the power to go to court and you're not there to take your guns away? And and the people who are authorized to do this, like you know, ex spouses, right? This is this is a part of the class of people who are you know authorized to go seek these emer ex spouses, right? Now, you can talk to a lot of divorced dudes, and they will tell you that their ex is bitter, and that she would lie and tell stories, and she'd be more than happy to go and get your ass arrested and have the cops come and take your stuff away. So, so when you open it up and say, you know, ex-wives, and she's there just talking all kinds of trash, you're not even there. You don't even know what she's saying. And then you lose your rights temporarily. Okay, I was just curious. So, you know, another, another issue is, is this, right? Why not, why not grab the person instead of their guns? If they're, if they're in extreme danger, why not take them into custody instead of seizing their firearms? That's because see, if, if they're dangerous, right? If that's the theory, right? They're dangerous. At any moment, they're just going to go off and just start blasting people, right? So why take their guns? Why not take them? Well, good point. Okay, Charlie. Because because if they take because if they take you, then you have a chance to go to court and say, "Hey, that's bullshit. That woman's lying." What about and, and, and you know? So I'm just saying. I mean, it's like, but it's hey, take the guns, take the guns. Hey, let's sacrifice every liberty interest we have in order to make us safe. All right. Well, what about like, like I said, Charlie, one more point. What about those Texas abortion laws where they uh, get a chance where the citizens can report on people? You know what? I mean, that I wondered about that myself. I, I just thought, you know, like, like, are we entering into some kind of like, you know, like, um, like fugitive woman area era, you know, where, where it's like abortion is le legal in one state, illegal in another. So a woman crosses the border to get an abortion and she comes back home, you know, and now is she under arrest because she went to another state to get an abortion? Can the other state grab her and send her back to her home state because she's trying to illegally obtain an abortion? I, I mean, it raises all kinds of issues like this. And, and, you know, I, some, somewhere that I'm sure there's a set of rules to sort all that stuff out. But I, I mean, it's, it's it, but laws change, like, you know, and we'll see how it evolves. And, and, and I'll just say this about the, you know, you, people's right to get an abortion, right? You should have stuck with my body, my choice. When, when all the, when all the people, you know, uh, you know, you got the, the liberal kind of entourage out there <clears throat> advocating for other liberal causes, like abortion rights, women's rights, all that stuff, right? And those are certainly valid issues, right? I'm not, I'm not diminishing those rights. But, you know, when you say that the government has the, an interest in ensuring that everybody take these COVID vaccines, you know, and we can exclude you from society if you haven't taken the COVID vaccines, well, it's your, the, your whole argument about my body, my choice to keep your hands off my body is over. It's over. So, so when, when we look back and say, who killed Roe versus Wade? I would say the COVID vaccines did. And all the people that were out there telling everybody, oh, stick them, stick them, Joe. He needs that vax.
Okay, uh, Charlie, you're next. Yeah, Brian. Charlie. There are, there are literally all kinds of linear processes of procedures in the enforcement of the laws. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why you think this is somewhat unique. There, I mean, it's a linear process. The burden of proof is on the person seeking raising the red flag. They are under oath. Like you seem to think they can lie at will. There are consequences for you not don't, telling you. You don't think people lie under oath? And it really? is a process. Uh, hey, they are under oath. Okay. There are consequences for lying under oath. Mm -hmm. um, now, the person poses a threat, not just to the individual, but to the community. Mm -hmm. And in the interest of the community, this is a process like there's all kinds of procedures out there. You need know I, I, I just outlined the procedure. I mean, there's all different ones in other areas. And you don't like this one. They, they, you have the burden of proof is on you to establish that the person poses a threat to the community. And well, the judge can determine on the basis of the evidence presented to either issue it or not issue it. Mm -hmm. And you have in a linear process, the right of appeal. So you're not denied anything. What about you know, notice and an opportunity you, to be heard? You want a telescope, you want a telescope all in one day. Well, I can see reasons why you don't want dangerous people in your courtroom. Uh, and I, I just, you, you are actually asserting that it's better to have 10 dangerous people at loose in our community than take away the rights of one innocent one. Uh, the scale of justice, what's one of, what scale are you using? I, I'm using the scale that, that was the foundation of American jurisprudence. <laughs> Uh, not not some some you know everybody's hysterical because bad stuff's happening so we need to take away everybody's rights and empower the government to do whatever we want because we're scared I, I mean you know Charlie it's one of these things where I'm you know when it comes to this idea of federalism and that the states are given power you know <clears throat> where where the federal government hasn't legislated I'm very happy for that because I, I understand that in a, in a democratic society like ours, that people will, will want to empower the government with powers I don't want the government to have. And, and so federalism, you know, states having sovereign powers to do, you know, to pass laws other than, you know, they don't all have to be uniform. States can do different things. So I want to move as far away from people like you as humanly possible. I mean, because you have no respect for anyone's rights. You'll just take it. There's no limit to government power with you. There's no right that can't be taken away with you. And all I think is, how do I get myself out of here and away from people like this? Because I don't... It, Steve, you're right. I'm sorry. It is a personal attack. So, so I I withdraw my comments as it relates to any any personal. It's not Charlie that I'm trying to get away from. It's this this idea, right? This this that that government we need to we need to give away our rights. We need to grant the government extraordinary powers to deal with whatever problems are happening today. And and. You know, it, it's just at, at what point does it become too much? I All mean, right. when when the presumption of innocence and, and basic due process rights are eroded, I believe it's become too much. The person is not denied due process at any stage of the process. There are all sorts of multiple things, even in labor law. I have to, I use about 12 different procedures. And they say, well, this one I don't like. That's what makes my job. In, in, in labor law, somewhat interesting because each of the 12 have different stages and steps and requirements. So this was just one that they have, and I could perceive very good reasons 
for the way they operate. It's so like that it very quickly. Yeah, I, I mean, basically, 14 you know, days is nothing. Oh, sure. Hey, so it's 100% fine to take away any right people have for 14 days based on, you know, a hearing that they're not even there. They don't know what's going on. So, hey, let's let's just standardize this practice of just someone goes to court and makes allegations against another person. The judge evaluates those allegations without the benefit of another person saying, I didn't say that. I didn't do that. Here's evidence that shows that person who's being accused isn't there. They don't you know. Get a copy they have of the no chance to respond. Back so you think you about a fair hearing. You get a hearing. copy of the, of the court proceeding, and man, <laughs> you look it over and go back. Okay. Back. Okay. So so the person isn't there, and their rights are taken away. I mean, that's this is the part that you're you're missing, is that whether it be for 14 days or 21 days, that person's rights have been taken from them. In a, in a proceeding in which they weren't even present. So you tell me in, in what civilized, you know, Western democratic, you know, country, this idea of a, of a civilized, you know, world where people have rights and government power, if the government can just based on an allegation, just step in, take your right, allegation coming from the police, no less, just come in and take your rights away from you. And then you got to fight to get them back. That's nuts. Uh, you know, unless the, so the order can expire and your rights will be given back to you after 14 and 20, 21 and 14 days. Okay. Let's move on to our next question. Are you ready, Brian? Did you get your answer, Charlie? Yeah, he, he doesn't want to recognize that the burden of proof is on the person seeking the red flag. Oh, okay. Very so, and, and what I'm it saying is not is an this. application. You don't fill out an application. Okay. You have to go before a third party. And, and what I'm saying to be affected. So, All what's right. your problem? So, burden of proof, right? It's not an application. Okay, burden burden of proof, right? The the application is reviewed for merit. Oh, 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 oh okay. <laughs> is it not? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Except there's only one person presenting the facts. And that's the accuser, the accused, right? The one we're supposed to be protecting. Our legal system is designed to protect the rights of the accused. Like, like, uh, like, 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 the, like how the FBI violated Trump's. Uh, there, there, are, there, no, here, no, I ain't even going process. there, Tim. Don't even start Not me, man. Don't process. even start me. It's a linear process. Many uh -huh. of these are linear. All right, I don't Charlie. know what his problem is with that. Yeah, All we right. heard it. We heard it, Charlie. All right, let's go. I got, uh, I think on the phone, is that Jake? Uh, the phone number ending in uh, 2935. I mute and ask your question. Um, I don't know how, okay, how do you want me, yeah, a phone caller, um, I think can you hear, can you oh. hear me, can you hear me, yes, okay, you mentioned something about an environmental case, uh, West Virginia versus the EPA, what was that about? So, so the EPA had engaged in rulemaking, and what they were doing was, the so the West Virginia sued them and said the EPA has exceeded the authority granted to them by Congress that by through this this procedure in which they were expanding the use of certain tests that they were you know that that companies or you know whoever they they oversee were required to meet in order to meet their standards so what the supreme yeah. court said was that you know congress has been given the authority to pass laws not you and if congress wanted you to have that authority congress would have passed a law granting you that authority and they did not oh. so oh, so the, the epa you mean yeah, yeah. That the, basically what the Supreme Court said is that the EPA has no authority to make law. Okay, so what was the specific context? Is what I'm asking. Well, so so, and what I'm saying is, and as I said, I did not read the case. I read the summary of the case, and so okay, the summary so of the case. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it outlined the issues and it outlined kind of what the court's decision was, 
And, and it's really yeah. based on, you know, basic principles of federalism, you know, that, that, that states have the authority. Okay, but what was, it, what was the specific environmental issue? It was, it was a test that the EPA was applying. Test of what? The test that they apply to. So in order to, like the EPA sets out standards, and if you want to conduct business, right. then you got to meet their standards. So they they right. use tests to determine whether complete people comply with their standards. And what the, the, the state was asserting was that the, you know, the rules that the EPA was was switching to expanded their powers. And it was for, for what? Be more specific. What? What? Um, what I can't. I can't be uh, more. I can't be more. You specific don't know. You don't I know. Didn't, well, I didn't. It would. It would. It would. It would help. It would help. Are you? In, are you in favoring? Are you, are you in favor of of, of deregulating uh, restaurants? The health department doesn't have to do an inspection of, of of restaurants every year. So if somebody comes down with food poisoning, that's okay. Well, I, I mean, I'm not against regulation. I mean, I'm against overregulation. You know, I'm I'm against okay. abuses of power. Well, sometimes businesses abuse power by 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 forcing the surrounding community to have to deal with pollutants, which are not legal, which which uh, you know, which they they sh which they shouldn't be because it makes people sick. Well, and, and that's true, right? But it, but a restaurant doesn't have has the authority to lock you in a cage, to take your property from you, to you know send armed you know men to your house. Well, either, to either, you either, either does the either either does the EPA. Well, well I believe absurd, I believe the EPA has a SWAT team. What? I said I believe the EPA has a SWAT team. No, they have a SWAT team. They can shut down a business for non-compliance. I think they can shut down a business for non-compliance with EPA. I don't know if they can shut you down, but they well, can fine you heavily for non-compliance with EPA rules. Depends yeah, on the rule. I, I mean, so so not to go too far off the ranch. I don't want to go too far off the ranch here. But it, what I'm saying is that the you know so the EPA has got given a certain grant of authority. The Supreme Court said they exceeded their authority. I, I mean, issues about restaurants. I mean, that's, is there a federal law? I'm sure there is some federal law that regulates some, some OSHA requirements. So uh, you know, probably, you know, all that probably, stuff is already that's regulated. Probably state law. It's probably state law. Well, I, th I think what happens is that the states implement federal law, and then the federal government gives them grants. Yeah. I, I, mentioned, I mentioned that because I know of one case. I'm going to try to be brief here. I know of one case of a friend of mine who... Uh, went on a trip to Morocco. She ended. Up, she she was enjoying the trip, and all of a sudden, she came down with a cute case of of, of uh, food poisoning. But it wasn't just her. About seventy seventy people uh, uh, seventy people on the trip got sick at the same time. I don't know the specific circumstances, but the point is, she she left the she left the trip early, flew back to uh, Chicago, and a few days later, she ended up dying of pneumonia. This was from food poisoning. Yeah. I mean, it happens, right? I mean, you know, despite all the all the all the regulations, and so so no, this is this point, inherently the point raises is, the question, is, right? The point is, wait, wait, wait. The, you, you're missing the point. The point is, in a place like Morocco, they don't have the food safety standards that we have here. It's very under, it's very underregulated. Okay. I mean that that may be the case. I I don't know. I've never yeah. been to Morocco. Yeah. But, you know, so so here's the thing about that kind of stuff, right, when it comes to regulating yeah. food safety. If you have, yeah. in our modern world, we have things like Angie's List. We have lots of places where people can offer reviews. And, you know, you have private companies that can, you know, certify that a restaurant's, you know, um, that their their wait staff is good and and that their their restaurant is clean and that it meets the standards that this organization you don't need the government to set safety that isn't standards. So. That isn't so. There aren't any there aren't any private companies that do that. It's, 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 there are it's there the are theater, private there the are state. private companies that do that. However, it is the government that has has asserted a monopoly over the ability to certify whether your stuff is safe and and so. When it comes to the consumer, right, we have to rely on the government to tell us that this is safe. I mean, if you look at the, you know, the COVID uh, vaccines, for example, they are safe and effective, yeah. right? 
and they're they're ninety five percent. No, 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 forty, no, twenty percent effective. The forty percent effective. Twenty twenty. And much more. Ish. I don't know. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's move on here. Doug Binkley, I got a question. Nice yeah, Brian, uh, you did, I think, briefly um, step Brian, over to part where the... Um, Doug, um, if you got a video, show yourself, please. Go ahead, Doug. Okay, Doug. Uh, uh, sorry, you wouldn't want to see the background. <laughs> uh, the thing is, uh, Brian, I think you uh, stepped around uh, the place where... Um, government, or at least we would hope government or the courts would uh, have a weighing of uh, the rights of one person against another when they conflict. And um, I wonder at what point uh, you think that uh, the rights of individuals not to be killed. Um, and uh, I realized that um, you object to the fact that uh, certain rights are not listed in the Constitution, but I think we all kind of agree that the Declaration of Independence where you're guaranteed the right to life and liberty um, has some effect in our law. Um, at what point uh, do the rights of a person with a gun to kill as many people as possible whenever he feels like it, uh, like the guy in Uvalde did, um, conflict with the, li the rights of uh, people and, and children to uh, not have their lives taken away? How many lives do you wish to have the right to take away from people because you decide to come at them with your M? 16 rifle at what point how many lives do you insist be weighed against your one right to take their lives okay um so so what you're doing is emotionalism right i mean what you're doing is oh my god the children somebody please save the children and take the guns away to save the children so so what that is that's that's hysterical emotionalism where where you focus on this act done by one, two, and you know, and and several times a year, many, many times a year, people in the United States use weapons to kill other people. That happens quite a bit. So, so I would ask you this, right? In the 30 years or so that these shootings have been happening, what has the government done to determine the cause? Why are people doing this? Like, I remember, like, I'm 50, I'm 51 years old. I don't remember these kinds of mass shootings when I was a kid. This is a recent phenomenon. So, so it, the guns haven't changed. People have had, Americans have had firearms since the beginning of this country. Heavy weapons, heavy weapons. The Tommy gun was legal, right? Semi-automatic weapons have been around forever. So, so the question isn't, you know, how do we take people's guns away? It's why are people doing this? And what can we do to prevent them from doing this? What, what, are, the, what are the causes, right? So if you look at what's changed over the last 50 years, right? Or, or 30 years, how, how many kids today- You're answering the question. Uh, no, because you're- How many question, lives go against your- no, How many lives because you're asking me the wrong right to question. Take their lives. You're asking me emotionalism. I'm not responding to your emotion. Yeah, I'm mad as hell. Like I'm responding the, like with Like in reason. the movie network, I'm mad as hell. You're right. Yeah, and so you're responding with emotionalism and not reason. What you think, I mean, what you're, what you're going at is it, the same thing. It doesn't thing. invalidate the question and you haven't answered it, sir. Because you asked the wrong question. You asked the wrong question. You asked a stupid question. All right. Exactly. So, all right. So exactly. this is, here's your here's your question, right? How many? How many? So so what? Repeat your question. Okay, go ahead. I ask you how many lives of innocent people do you weigh against your right to take them, which you seem to think that. Okay. Guns so, so let me tell you why your question is absolutely rifles. ridiculous. And, and I do not claim the is, right. I do not claim the right to hurt anybody. To, so what are you talking about? Exactly. Your question is simply emotionalism wrapped up in some kind of facade. Exactly. And I don't want to hear it. I That's want to hear right. about the rights of the people and the authority of the government, the uh -huh. political authority that the government's claiming to in a no due process. Okay, you've revealed yourself. You don't care about the rights of the people. Okay, you've revealed yourself. Well, <clears throat> 
Well, Doug, when Doug first asked uh, his question, his first part of his question was, at what age does a person have to be before somebody else does not have a right to kill them? And my sure. answer to that is, is uh, at Nothing to do with it. That's absurd. I mean, your question is absurd. It's emotionalism. And, I, and I'm not trying to hear all that. Okay. I, I, got, I got a question for you. Um, um, well, is, is someone, is, is someone, someone, what? You already had a what? question. It's just two people ahead of you yet. Okay. All right. Sorry. Leon and Dan, go ahead next. All right. I got a question. Um, you say, what about crazy people, mentally ill people who are very sick? They are put into a hospital against their will. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a government law that should be thrown out? I mean, the crazy person doesn't get a right to, to, to testify in court. Is that similar to what you're saying? Well, I, I mean, so, that, you know, before a person is committed, right? I mean, if they're mentally insane, you know, if they're mentally incapacitated, they, they more than likely have someone who speaks on their behalf and makes decisions on their behalf. So that yeah. person, you know, you know, you're talking about involuntary you know, like someone being committed involuntarily. I don't know what those rules are. I haven't looked into it. Okay, okay what about, I have another question. What about, what about a law that says people can't give water to people in line when they're voting? Is that a ridiculous law, according to you? Well, so I, I would say this, right? Now, now, now you think about that law, right? You think about just how ridiculous that actually is, right? That you could actually be prohibited from giving another person water, that that could be some kind of crime or to be subjected to a civil penalty because of that. That's outrageous. But the way these, these court rules apply, the way these laws are being interpreted, if the legislature passed a law that said you are prohibited from giving water to someone in line, uh, you know, if there's a compelling state interest in, in, in denying you that ability or prohibiting you from doing that, then that law would most likely be upheld. So you mean so, the interest of the Republican Party? Well, you know, so but but that's the thing. When the government outlines its compelling state interest, they're not really asked to to. You know, it's more like just an assertion if it's rationally related to a compelling government interest, you know, like, you know, like mass shootings and the availability of firearms, those, those two things, how are those two things interconnected? How are those, how are they related? Because if you look at, you know, the incidents of these mass shootings where some person just randomly goes out and commits a mass homicide, that is a recent phenomenon. It did happen. It has happened in the past, but the frequency in which it's happening is a new phenomenon. And, and rather than examining why this phenomenon is occurring, because I could give you a couple of theories, right? So because the guys like you, you no, know, because of psychiatric meds, they, sure. they, they give kids, kids like, like derivatives of methamphetamines, right? All these, all these they give there are millions of children in this country that are taking psychiatric meds. Why? When when I when I was when I was growing up, I don't know of anybody who took psychiatric meds. Anybody. But they're all over the place now. So is that possibly, you know, could that be part of the part of the issue? The fatherless homes, right? Most of these shooters come from fatherless homes, right? Rather than taking people's guns away, why doesn't the government try to figure out how to get fathers back in the home, raising their kids, how to how to help these kids become stable and, and productive, right? No, let's just take their guns. Like that's because uh, Archie Bunker said that uh, he saw for women's liberation as long as they stay at home to cook and clean. Long as what? To stay at home to cook and clean. Oh, okay. that's a different. It's a different world now, Tim. We can't talk about our cheap bunker. He's uh, he's on the. He's canceled, isn't he? Yeah, I think he is canceled. All right. <laughs> Are you done with uh, your question there? Fathers teach their children their sons how to shoot and use those guns. Fathers teach their children how to moderate their. Aggression. They tell them. Hey, fathers teach their children. Guy. 
for All right, sure proportionate later, uses of order. force. All right, they so there, there is actually a theory about gun. this stuff. So, so right. the psychologist outlined what he called rough and tumble play, that men play with their kids differently than women do. Right. Men will wrestle with them. And, and so in the course of wrestling, this physical play that fathers have with their children, children learn restraint because if they're wrestling and they kick dad in the balls, fun time's over. So they learn don't kick dad in the balls. You can punch him in the arm. No problem. You can even give him a shot to the gut. But don't kick him in the balls. Right. So this is this is like. You know, what do men teach children? And they teach them how to is, is to, guns. To, restrain, to restrain their aggression and to moderate the use of force. How to, how to, how to use proportionate force. Be, just because someone punches you in the arm doesn't give you the, the right to bust their nose, right? There, there's a proportionate use of force that fathers teach their children. But yet, we have with with these domestic relations laws and these custody laws we have and these and these welfare laws we have shoved fathers out of, out of the kids lives and now we got these kids going off and hey rather than addressing the problem let's give them some meds the so proud boys have happen? children who cares the let's proud take boys have guns. children all right all right let's move on casper you're next on the question please go ahead children of proud boys I, I mute Casper and uh, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Ah, okay. Um, so I wanted to ask about the red flag laws. So, from my understanding of the issue, it seems like people would support that because um, they're so like most or a lot of the shooters have had mental health issues or they were known to FBI or local police for various behaviors or they had trouble in school with behavior issues or maybe they just struggled like um, intellectually with their studies. Um, if you don't believe that red flag red flag laws are the answer, how do you deal with because we do have a problem. I mean, you mentioned that, oh, okay, some of these men probably don't have strong father figures. Well, that's the reality. They don't, maybe they don't have strong father figures. How are we going to deal with that as a society if uh, this legal solution is not the correct solution, in your opinion? Well, I mean, this has been going on for 30 years. I mean, this, there's nothing new about this, right? So in 30 years, no one has bothered to figure out why this is happening, right? The only, because the only thing politicians talk about is not why this is happening. What are some of, the, some, of the, some of the issues that could lead to these results? The only thing they've been talking about is take the guns. The only choice is take the guns, take the guns, take the guns, right? And that's the only alternative that we're being presented. It's the only alternative that we're discussing. We don't talk about how, hey, Maybe we should get the fathers back involved in these kids' lives. Maybe we should stop giving kids derivatives of methamphetamine. Maybe we should stop giving, putting kids on Xanax and, and Ritalin, right? Maybe we should help them, you know, help them learn to cope. Oh, oh no, you know, no, let's take the guns away, right? I mean, so, so the thing is, so what should we do about it now since it's already been blown, right? We've already blown 30 years on this, right? So what do we yeah. do now that it's blown? I, I don't know. I mean, to be, to be honest with you. And, and my issue more with the, 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 these emergency ex parte hearings is that the accused is not even represented. He doesn't even have a lawyer present. Right. So if you want to exercise these these red flag laws, right, if that's what society wants to do. Right. I would say this, that if we want to look out for the rights of the accused, that the accused should be appointed an attorney. He doesn't have to be present, but an attorney should be appointed for him and the attorney should be present. And that attorney who is paid for by the state should go to the person and explain to them what happened what the findings were, what they should do, what their legal rights are, because we're taking this extraordinary leap, right? That we're taking a person's liberty from them without notice and an opportunity to be heard. Shouldn't the rights of the accused in that circumstances, if you say, 
okay, we have to do this because otherwise people are going to be out there shooting the joint up, right? So if we have to do this, right, which I disagree with, then at least at a bare minimum, an attorney should be appointed for the accused. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I, have, I have idea. How about like establish some uh, courses okay, for, Lana, the, Lana, for Lana. the fathers? You know, they can learn how to Lana. take care of the sons and daughter. How about that? Hey. More, okay, okay. you know, Lana, more courses. Lana. It's not blah blah blah. It's very important. Hey, 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 hey. Very important. Hey, hey, fathers. Hi, fathers. Hi, Brian. Brian, let's uh, let's move on. We got Raj next as a question. Yeah, classes. It's very important. Raj, go ahead. You're up next. Yes. Uh, we 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 are talking we are talking about a very serious issue about uh, law and morality and all those things. But uh, every day in municipal court, you go and you sit down, and uh, cases are heard and and judges rule rule within 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 seconds or minutes. So I mean, what how judge judge manages to rule? On a something which is so so little thing, little not important thing, but guy ended up police arrested him, and guy ended up and he has to do something. In a, how whole system works in a fair way to the society as well as the accused? How do they manage it? Well, I, I mean, I I hear you, right? I mean, it's you know, so if we're gonna do this balancing, right? I mean, I would say this, that in the in the case in which someone's rights are being taken from them at a hearing in which they have no notice and an opportunity to be heard, that an attorney should be appointed for that person to explain to them, to ask questions and, and to, to document. And it should be paid for by the state. If you're going to deprive someone of their rights, even temporarily, they should be afforded an attorney, someone to defend them, even if they can't be there themselves. And if you're going to have these no due process, no notice and opportunity to be heard hearings, the 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 accused should should be afforded an, a counsel. That's I what mean, I believe. Uh, is, it, is it practical? What, what you are saying? I hear you what you're saying that ideal system, but the amount of caseloads they have in a municipal court, you know, there I mean, I used to go to New York City court sometimes to sit down a couple of hours and listen to it. Yeah. There, there are 500 people in a court, that big, huge courtroom. And the cases come and the police, police officer come and this thing comes and a case heard. And, you know, and I, I don't understand like that. Uh, it is not a question of a deeper issue deeper philosophy of what is right and what is wrong, but how, how they mentally handle and how it, in final analysis the justice is done. Well, I mean, so, so, so here's what you're saying is this, right? Is that you sit in, you sit in court and you see 500 cases come by, right? Just people getting processed by, by the justice system, right? Be, and that's because there are so many laws like the laws are so numerous that it is inconceivable that any one person could know them all, right? So so my solution, my proposed solution to this stuff is to start peeling back some of these laws. What are we doing with all these? What are we accomplishing with all these laws? If you look at an example like the war on drugs, the war on drugs has been an absolute abominable failure. Their drugs are everywhere. I mean, all they're doing is is cri criminalizing and locking people up and kicking down doors, no knock warrants to, to justify this drug war, right? To maintain this drug war. Stop it, right? We don't need that. It's not working. You know, stop clogging up the court system. Stop, stop, you know, beefing up, creating SWAT teams. You know, give judges and, and, and public defenders and, and prosecutors a chance to process, you know, more of a chance to process where they're not so hurried and busied so that they can be more deliberate. So, so my suggestion would be to, to start removing some of these laws and start clearing up the courts so that, so that we can be more deliberate in our processes and, and, and more cautious about the rights of the, of the individual. Thank you. Okay. Jan All right, Jan, you're next. Jan Bodar. I, I don't I don't have a I had a comment instead of a question 
that's short. But okay. well, I wanted I I wanted to uh, in the spirit of what uh, Brian is saying. Uh, in Chicago, uh, uh, there were people, homeless people, sleeping on on the benches at the um, bus stop, and um, and I guess the CTA didn't like it. So you know what the solution was: remove the bench. There was absolutely no d idea of doing something to help people who were homeless. It was remove the bench. Yeah. And, and of course, this bothered me a lot because I need that bench to sit on and I go to the bus stop and the bench isn't there anymore. But um, another thing they did was put in benches with a big bar in the middle so you couldn't sleep there. Uh, how did that solve anything? It solved nothing. It solves nothing. And, um, and then I also, well, I'll, I'll stop there because I'm a little foggy on what else I wanted to say. I agree with you, though. It it um, it doesn't solve anything just to remove the. Although although I do have to say that um, I don't think we should have magazines with a hundred rounds in them, on the street. So yeah, uh, yeah, I, and and you know, I mean, to a certain extent, I agree with you, right? I mean, like, look, so so as I read the Second Amendment, right. It says that the people's that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Arms, right? It, are nuclear weapons arms? I, I would venture to say nuclear weapons are arms. Do I do I believe individuals should own nuclear weapons? Hell no, hell no. So you know, it's there is I think you know you, you know kind of looking at some of these you know the the foundational principles of the of the country and the and the constitution that you know there has to be room for reasonable interpretations of what's there and so you know if someone were to say you know does your right to bear arms to protect nuclear weapons i i would say at a strict reading of the law yes it does at a at a at a reasonable person person level i'd say no way you're out of your mind so you know i it's not like I'm not inflexible when it comes to this kind of stuff, but I, I think about you know the 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 quality of, of the the rights that that people enjoy, and and if you think you know the right to notice and an opportunity to be heard is important, if you think the presumption of innocence is important, then then I think that we need to be very very careful about getting all caught up in these red flag laws and the hysteria about these mass shootings, look, they're terrible. But, you know, let's not sacrifice foundational principles of jurisprudence that this country was built on in order to, to respond to these tragedies. Okay, I just wanna follow up with one thing. Um, there is a book called Thermonuclear Monarchy and it's written by a girl from Chicago, you know, Elaine Scarry? Uh, her brother Joe is one of us, uh, one of the people around here. Anyway, um, she's at Harvard, I do believe. And um, thermonuclear monarchy takes the position that once we had the thermonuclear bomb, the Second Amendment went out the window because the Second Amendment is the right to uh, defend yourself and to decide who you're going to defend yourself against. Yeah. And this is this is a right that has been completely uh, removed by the existence of the atomic bomb. I mean, it's a, it's a valid point. I, I don't, I don't agree with that entirely. I mean, I, mean, I think, you know, as, as we kind of think about what the, the second amendment means in, in the context of American history, it is that this is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And, and it is the people who retained the right to alter or abolish the government. Uh, you know, the, the constitution like it was the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and then the Constitution. So the Constitution is the second iteration of the government based on the principles espoused in the Declaration of Independence. So, so you know, and, and I would say that the Constitution is, is in many ways, you know, almost hopelessly flawed in, in the sense that, you know, like Black Americans were denied their basic humanity within the constitution. 
So when you think about the principles espoused that all men are created, like all, right, everybody, and, and then you see the Constitution and where there's this carve out, you know, where it's free men and three fifths of a person. So, so it, it's, you know, we, 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 you know, espouse this principle that all men are created equal, that we're endowed by a creator with certain unalienable rights. But then we give to the politicians the authority to decide who's a man and who's not, right? So, you know, like women had no right to vote. Well, how, how did they not have the right to vote? Isn't that an unalienable right? Represent a voice in the representation of government. But yet, you know, our constitution allowed for women to be excluded, you know, until 1920. And, and then it was 150 years and how, it, you know, the, the treatment of black Americans, that they were not even considered three fifths of a person. Like who gave these politicians the authority to decide who is a person entitled to basic human rights? And in that sense, I think the Constitution has you know, failed. I mean, it is it is absolutely a magnificent document. I'm not I'm not crapping on it. You know, the structure of our government is is pretty good. And if you look at, you know, I, I will I will, you know, rant against these vaccine mandates. But internationally, if you look at other countries, the U.S. fared far better when it came to, you know, thwarting the, the these efforts to vaccinate, forcibly vaccinate everybody in the country. The Supreme Court put the kibosh on it. And, and I, I thank the Supreme Court for that. <laughs> All right, Ileana and Dan, you got the next question. Go ahead. Okay. Sir. You okay. Um, you want if you got it. Yeah. All right. So you said you're for um, more social workers. So does that mean you're for less police? Like Black Lives Matter say we're going to defund the police. We're going to give more social workers. So more of these little boys don't grow up to be 20-year-old killers and shoot 100 people or 20 people. Uh, the the uh, 13th Amendment, I think you know, might know it. It yeah. says no slavery except in prison. Prison, you, we can have slavery. So there are prisons where people get nine cents a, an hour for doing work for corporations like McDonald's and, uh, and Jewel and Burger King and Pepsi and Coke. They make things for Pepsi and Coke and for pay nine cents an hour. Now, some <coughs> prisons pay zero cents an hour. And some of these people who are- who And are Whole Pepsi, Foods. Whole Foods. And uh, so some of these people will get in jail or prison for uh, shooting will end up making nine cents an hour. Are mm -hmm. you for the constitution for that? Thank you. Well, so I, I believe that that particular interpretation, you know, that, so, I mean, here, here's the difficulty that I have with it, right? I mean, on the, on the one hand, you know, slavery in the sense that, you know, you're forcing someone to work without compensation. I, I'm 100% opposed to that. That should never, ever be lawful in any sense. And when you say nine cents an hour, so they're being compensated, but it's basically nothing, right? So, so you know, the as I understand that restriction, right? The so in in a, in a, in a prison environment, right? You have people that they are an absolute cost to the society. That society has accepted the responsibility to provide for their care, to feed them, to, to ensure they're safe, to ensure they're warm, to, to treat them humanely, right. right? So once society has accepted that obligation, now it's 100% cost. So people are sitting in prison, just waiting, doing absolutely nothing, right? Well, what if that person, while they're there, they want to work? And, and they want to do something productive or they have the prison food? decides we want to have a farm so that people can feed themselves and the, the society doesn't have to incur that cost. Right so in that case, should they be able to, to work without, without wage because they're growing their own food? So, so it's like, you know, when you come to these questions of absolutes, I mean, 
I mean, it's rare that anything would be absolute. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't know about the 13th Amendment. I, I understand the principle. I understand the issue. But I don't know that you could word things in a way in which, you know, work within the prison isn't um, abusive and it's not. Well, uh, what if they start a union? Would be you be for that? <laughs> <laughs> and Charlie will get in there and get a pension. I trying to give the. Uh, well, no, I, I, I don't a, know. I'll need a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a good question. Uh, you know, it, and it's an it's an issue. I see a lot of talk about the thirteenth kind of hey, what about, for, for what slavery. About, what about the police issue? Giving more uh, help to these wayward males who start killing people. Well, do so so here's a worker, or do they need a cop to hit them in the head and handcuff them? Well, that, hey, that's another that's another good question. So so you know, like here's the thing about social workers and kind of this idea of mental health you know, where the state is given authority under some mental health provision to, to do what? Mm -hmm. Force you to, to engage in a treatment that you don't want, mm -hmm. right? I, I mean, you have to remember that there was a time in America mm -hmm. where the lobotomy, where, where they would sever people's frontal lobe. Yeah. And like that was, that was used as a way to treat anxiety. Well, do, right? do people so, choose prison? Did they say, I want to go to prison because I killed somebody? Well, what, what I'm saying is that that if you give the government the authority to, you know, to say, impose mental health treatment on people, which they have, the government does they have that authority. Right. Well, one of the one of the mental health treatments that the, the government used was a lobotomy. I mean, they would literally sever people's brains. So, so if you want the government to have that power, I, I mean, I, I, I question, you know, whether government should have that power. Okay. That uh, sounds really bad. So this idea of we should hire more social workers and less police, do you think that's going to, that's going to lead to a, a less, where, where government's less intrusive? Well, you, you said you're for Next, next question. Anyways, thank you. Thank you for your All right, Charlie, thank let's you. get down the next rabbit hole. Go ahead and ask, uh, ask your question. Yeah, Brian, you are so much so concerned about having a day in court for uh, gun owners. But if I bought a company today on Monday morning, I could fire anyone who is black. I could fire any women, no problem. Let's say I don't like immigrants either. So I, I'm gonna fire any Mexicans as well. Not one of them is going to get a day in court. You say there's too many laws. Uh, so I guess, are you, are you, what, what about their day in court? I don't have to call. I don't have to talk to anybody. I don't got to meet any, with anybody. You're out. Goodbye. <laughs> See you around. What about their day in court? What are, are their you, labor laws? Uh, uh, How do you can, know can they you, were all Can you rephrase, can you rephrase you know your question? How do you know according to the law? <laughs> can, can you rephrase your question? I don't, I don't understand. Well, do you, you think they're entitled to a day in court? Anyone who was fired? Fired from right a job? Representation, right to have so, attorney. Wait, so a person who's fired from a job. So you've yeah. got a job with a private company and you're fired. And do I think they should have a day in court? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. What does that yeah. have anything to do with the Constitution, Charlie? I, I mean, you know, here's so, the thing. Well, you know, you, you want a due process. For gun owners, I want due process for employees. A private employer does not have the legal authority to kidnap you, to kill you, to take your property, right? So your talk about private employers, I am talking about government. Government is granted the legal authority to come into your house, take your things, take you and if you resist you them they will Wait kill a minute. We're you. your employer about doesn't about have that authority charlie firing everyone that i want 
they get no appeal process, no due process. Is that Charlie, okay with question you? question to you is why did you buy the business in the first place if you're going to can everybody? Them, I want to know, are they anybody that I fire and he's so concerned about appeals and ex, ex parte? Uh, but Charlie, people get no hearing so, at all. Do, do, you, do you have a right to a job? Do I get a hearing or not? Do you have a right to a job? Do I get a hearing or not? Charlie, there are telephone books full of employment attorneys that would be anxious to take your case if yeah. you were wrongfully dismissed. Believe me, I get calls all the time at work from people that have employment problems and want to sue their, their attorney or sue their uh, employer, and I refer them to a good employment attorney. So, so you'll have your day in court, but that's a, that's a civil the law, matter, Charlie. Are they it, it's like breach of contract. Day in court. <clears throat> I, I don't know. I mean, what your your question? You make this assumption that that private employers are equivalent to government, and they are not. A private employer cannot come into your home and take your stuff or shoot you and kill your dog, throw you in a cage. A private employer can't do that. You're talking about, when you're talking about, you know, your rights, most of the time we're talking about government action, not, not, not a private employer. If, if, if federal law, right, which, which does, the federal discrimination laws are also based on the Commerce Clause, be, and the reason it's based on the Commerce Clause is there was a, a black couple that traveled from one state to another and they wanted to stay in a hotel. And that hotel was segregated so they couldn't stay there. So they took them to court and the, and the Congress said that we have the authority under the Commerce Clause to regulate that, that the Constitution gives us that authority and our authority to regulate commerce. So, so it was the Commerce Clause. It's commerce that discrimination is related to. So, so if an employer violates your your rights, your right to be, you know, free from discrimination, then you have a claim and go pay a lawyer and to fight your case. You're fired, though. OK, that's the way it goes, Charlie. But you will have your day in court. It's not the government later, denying later. your ability to have like a hearing. The, the day in court is later, right? After you've been fired? Is it before, you during, or after? You don't have a right to a job. Before, during, or after? My you never. Is. You never have a right to a job. The job is someone else's business. You're just filling a role. And if they want to trash you and, and, and get rid of you, they can as long as they do it in accordance with the law. It has nothing to do with your rights. If you think your rights are violated, you've been discriminated against, then take them to court. I mean, what I'm talking about is a no due process hearing. You are not there that the state is taking away your rights at a hearing in which you're not present. And you want to talk about employers. I mean, you fire me. Uh, I, I think it's time. Pro justice delayed is justice denied. OK, Charlie, it's I'm time. not there when the guy when the owner decides to fire me. You got to move on to the next questioner. Take All it right. to court, Charlie. Yeah. Uh, besides, Charlie, uh, why would you buy that business in that in the first place and waste all your money and get rid of all your employees? That makes no sense. All right, Margaret, you're up next. That's the silliest thing I've heard. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm still stuck on, on the right to not get a COVID vaccine. Um, the uh, What happened in countries that closed down essentially is they did not have a high mortality rate so a lot of people did not die here we had the vaccine deniers and we had trump and we had this whole thing with business and and delaying and denying and not uh, acknowledging the the severity and and the of of the uh pandemic and we have like a million people die here. Mm -hmm. And um, and many other places in terms of percent per hundred thousand or whatever, 
ever had a much lower death rate. So my question is, Wait a minute, Margaret, were those people right. morbidly I'm obese? I'm sorry, like most can you shut up and let me talk? I am, this is my time. I have a question. My question is, what, it, what is, is the right of the person to not get a COVID vaccination when, for example, they might be required by their job because they're a health worker yeah. and, they're, and they work with a great number of people who they could expose to get COVID and they're required to get a COVID in, uh, vaccination and then they're fired when they don't. That right, uh, as opposed to my right not to be infected by somebody who should be vaccinated, who I go to a healthcare facility to get healthcare and, um, and and I shouldn't be exposed to all of that. Now, I worked uh, 35 years as a nurse. So we had to get all kinds of vaccinations. We had to get a flu shot every year. We had to get measles vaccination. We had to be tested for tuberculosis every year. You know, there were a bunch of things that we had to do so that we were safe to give care to people who were vulnerable to what was going on. So what, what is my right as, as a person not to get sick or not to be exposed to a, an infectious disease versus that person's saying, it's my body, I can do what I want with it. And my answer is, well, get the fuck out of healthcare. I mean, you know, what, what can, can you balance that for me? Because, you know, the way we did it here a million people died. What is that? And it's probably a lot more than that. And in fact, even now, when it's way down, the rate is 400 people a day in this country die from COVID now, today. Okay. So that's a, it's a really good question. Um, and, I, and I've thought about this some. So there was a Supreme Court case, and you've probably seen it, where it, where it dealt with a smallpox vaccine. It was it was kind of rolling around as justification, as legal justification as to why the federal government can implement these these vaccine mandates. And it and it basically the, so the facts in it. This was a I think a 1915 case. It's old, um, and they were given the smallpox vaccine. Some person, so it was a a, a, a local. It was a city. <laughs> or a county ordinance. So the person who was the subject of the case, he had had a bad reaction to a previous vaccine, so he didn't want it. So what the Supreme Court said was that the, you know, he could be fined for not getting the vaccine. It's not that the, they could force him to get the vaccine, right? It's not like they could hold him down and inject him, but they could fine it, right? It's coercive measures, not necessarily force. So, so from that, right, I mean, there's, there's this kind of quasi support for nation, you know, for vaccine mandates, right, this idea that, you know, when you're, you know, that you're carrying an infectious disease that could mutate, and they have this vaccine that is proven to be safe and effective, that, you know, can you be coerced into getting it. So, now, when I read that case, right, I thought, you know, it makes sense, right? I mean, if, if we have this deadly virus that is easily transmissible, and if people quarantine, we can control the spread, right? Or, or perhaps, you know, eliminate the spread. So, so I understand the, the justification for wanting to implement a COVID vaccine mandate, and I understand that there is some legal support for it. To that, I would say this. If, if that were me, I would, have, I would have said this. The smallpox vaccine, at the time that that case was decided, in 19, I think it's 1905, the smallpox vaccine at that time had been around for over 100 years it was in widespread use. It was, you know, a very simple formula. 
that it would, you know, give you an attenuated virus so that your body would, that, that is not the case with the COVID vaccines. The COVID vaccines were, you know, like six months old. I understand that, you know, they had tested separate components of what went into the vaccine, but the, the whole, right, the, the drug itself, when it comes into its, you know, when all those separate component parts come together, the, the vaccine is something different. It's, it, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So while, you know, individual parts of the vaccine may have been tested for long periods of time, the COVID vaccine in its entirety had not. So, so when you say, yeah, 20 years in development of the mRNA technology, but that particular spike protein that dealt specifically with the COVID vaccine and how it all came together, right? So what I would have said is that in a case where you have a vaccine that is proven, proven to be safe and effective, right? And, and, and the smallpox vaccine is incredibly effective. So effective that smallpox has been eradicated because once you get the vaccine, you don't get smallpox, unlike the COVID vaccine. Right. That's more of a treatment because it doesn't it doesn't prevent you from getting COVID. It, it might decrease your chances, but it doesn't stop. So so the mutations is, is still going to happen as long as the virus is alive and spreading. It's going to mutate. So the COVID vaccines don't stop the spread. So it's not it doesn't inoculate you like a like a smallpox vaccine does. So so. And it might save lives as a treatment, as a treatment, right? That that it prepares the body so that when it gets inspected with the COVID vaccine, that the body's ready to deal with it. So so it may save lives, but when you're considering whether it saves lives, right? You have to consider the long-term effects, the side effects add the likelihood of adverse reactions. And at the time these COVID vaccines were being distributed and forcibly distributed, and, and it's not your right to spread a virus, it's your right to give informed consent. Do you, cons do you, are you informed and do you consent? And with the COVID vaccines, no one could possibly have been informed. There was no long-term data. So, so, so in, in this case, it's like you took away people's right to give informed consent with some with some drug that has no long term data that 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 politicians openly lied about. They they lied. I mean, it's ninety five percent effective. Oh, extremely rare breakthrough cases. Oh no, it's forty percent effective. How effective is it now? I don't know. Ish ten maybe. I don't know. Right. And with the safety, they had no long term safety data. How could they say it's safe when they have no long term safety data? Completely unlike the smallpox vaccine. So so, you know, when you're talking about this stuff, I mean, you're talking about taking away people's right to give informed consent. In well, I, I would I would submit that. Any drug that you take, regardless of what it is for, whether it is for high blood pressure or diabetes or whatever it is, many of those drugs do not have any long-term, any long-term trials and do not have any trials where they are given with the, and see what their interactions are with other drugs. And most people, who are older will take more than one drug. And there's no studies that show how these drugs interact with each other. So yeah. we are in, if, if you wanna do it that way, we're in a, uh, a situation here in healthcare where we are all uninformed consumers with whatever we're doing. Okay. Because that's, because that's the situation, that's one. And the second thing is, is that what what was tr what the the goal of giving the vaccines was to create quote herd immunity whether people would would be 
enough people would be vaccinated that it wouldn't spread. But then that got lost when enough people were not vaccinated who got sick that the vac that the uh, virus was able to mutate where it became resistant to the inf to the vaccination. But what ended up happening is that the mortality rate and the, and the morbidity rate is or the severity of the disease that you get is much, much lower if you've been vaccinated than if you haven't. That's one of the reasons that the death rates have gone down so much that the uh, that the vaccine has has made people they still get the COVID. Right, but right. they don't get as sick, and they don't go in the hospital, and they're not as severely ill. Okay, Margaret, that's okay. a question. So, so no. excuse me, Lana. Let, let me answer this before I before I forget. So, so when you accepted your job in healthcare, did you sign off on something that said you may be asked to take drugs without long term data, and this is a condition of employment, right? So, so. You know, I work in the accounting field and the, in the legal field, right? I, I have never signed anything like that. No employer has ever asked me for my medical records. They've never asked me for my vaccination status. It has been up until COVID, it, not anything I would even consider mm -hmm. thinking about. Mm -hmm. So, so when this came up, right? You're changing the conditions of employment for a person like me because I never agreed to that. Now, in, in your in your field, right, healthcare, if when you signed on, you agreed to that, hey, uh, sorry, I mean, that's unfortunate. But, you know, that's the well, deal. I mean, it is fortunate because I didn't get any patients sick. Well, so, so, all right, you, th you think so, right? I mean, oh, yeah. It, but, but as you said, as you said yourself, right, that, you know, this idea, so, so the, and I could find this data if somebody, if you want to challenge me on this, but the Ryan, the employer, the employer can impose new drug laws. One full laws. at a time, Charlie. One full at a time. Charlie, Charlie one full at a time. Don't can get so, so while Joe Biden, anytime. right? So so there's there's data that came out of the UK and they went all the way back to when this started from <clears> January <throat> of 2021. And they they tracked the the deaths from COVID and non COVID by vaccination status. So while Joe Biden in, in J July of last year is out there, you know, saying this vaccine, it, it prevents transmission. And all we got to do is jab 95% of people and then it'll slow the virus and it'll stop the mutations. So while he's saying all that stuff, the, this data coming out of the UK shows that half of the people dying from COVID were fully vaccinated. Exactly. Well, that's what so so he's up there saying, right, this vaccine is going to save everybody. He's just gotta, we just got to jab 95% of people, safe and effective, safe and effective. And then all the time he's saying that, mm -hmm. half the people dying of COVID are fully vaccinated. Exactly. I would really there appreciate so much it if you could give me a I, will, I, will, I, will, I would really appreciate it if it was published things. in the British Medical Journal or in Lancet or one of the of the uh, acknowledged research journals, because I don't think that's true. Okay, hey, uh, and yes. I will and I will find the data, <clears throat> and I will I will put it in the chat. Okay, it's good. So, <clears throat> so you're 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 probably preaching that's misinformation, one. man. Are you on misinformation? Margaret. Yeah, you you don't know what the you don't know what you're talking quick. about. How about oh, Lana, this is not the time for crosstalk. No, I want to. It is not the time for crosstalk. Ask you like no. It is not the time for How about people can No, just stop. I muted her. All right, let's move on to our next question. Doug, so, so I, I do want to say one other thing. So when you go out to the public space, right? So you, you, you leave your home and you enter the public space. Do you believe you have a right to know the medical status of every person in the public? Do, no. you, do you need to know their medical history to see if you're safe? Are they trying to kill you because they don't have some, some, some drug that you took, right? I mean, you have no right to know other people's medical history, none. 
And, and right so when you enter the public space, you take the risk that you're going to be exposed to germs, that you're going to be exposed Ridiculous. to viruses, exposed exactly. to risk. Yeah. That's yeah. life. Oh, no. I understand you that. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I was talking about was were the people who were healthcare people refused to take the vaccine. Okay. And a person who goes into a healthcare situation does in fact deserve that he doesn't that he or she is does not get an infectious disease because the person who's taking care of them has refused to protect themselves appropriately. Oh, okay, so so as I understand the issue that was raised by many medical people that all that wound up many of whom wound up quitting their jobs because they had COVID, they had natural immunity to it. Why? Because and they were sitting there saying to themselves, "Why am I going to get a vaccine for a, a, a disease that I've already had?" I've recovered. I have immunity. I have the antibodies. That's if COVID right. crops up, I'll beat it. I already have. And, and, and it, but yet, even those people who had this immunity were forced to get this, this vaccine of unknown safety and efficacy. So why did they protest? I understand exactly why they protest, because they said, I don't need this. I don't want it. I've already been exposed. I'm already immune. Why do I need this vaccine? And no one could answer them. Mm -hmm. no I, I answer they gave safe right. and effective. I'll just Take make jab or lose your job. one more point. And that is that the knowledge and the research on the COVID virus change practically on a daily basis about what actually was going on and what the capabilities of the virus were and the, and the possibilities of mutations and all those other things. And because it kept changing and, and the, the CDC and the NIH and, all, and, and Fauci and all the uh, other people who were officials who were responding to it had to take those changes into account. Mm -hmm. And so all of that, you know, they were saying one thing at the beginning and then they were saying one thing at the end, but it was because things had changed so much with the situation and our knowledge of the situation. And, and the long-term effects of things, I mean, I think that it's not, it's not irrelevant. You're, you're correct. We don't know the long-term things, the long-term long problems with things, but we don't know the long-term problems with practically everything that we do. Okay. So, so, and I would say to that, you know, so, so we don't know, right. We don't know. We're, we're taking, we're taking a best guess. This is a unique situation. We don't know. So because we don't know, let's force everyone to take this, this vaccine that doesn't have any long-term data. That's the solution. That's insane. But I'm ready for it. But we do know that it prevented, at least initially, it prevented the transmission of for how For how long? Now the well, that's the point that the okay. virus changed. And that part we didn't know, but we did know that it prevented the transmission of the COVID uh, virus. We did know that Brief, briefly, and, and and as and it as it has later come out, that protection you know against infection lasted for what about sixty days. I mean, well, no, I think it was closer to five or six months. But okay, you know. well, whatever. I mean, that drug is never going to leave people's bodies. It's going to be in there forever. You have forever changed their body chemistry based on theory. Well, you, you have an incorrect understanding of the immunological response, but other than that, anyway. And, and I'll say this. So when COVID first started, the, the estimated death toll was 0.3%. That was the CDC said, how many people do we expect to die? 0.3%, right? And that is that is roughly how many people died. Like there's 330 million people in the US, 0.3% is about a million, and which is how many people died. So I will ask you, right? If, if the, the number of people estimated to die is actually the number of people who died, then what did all these preventative measures accomplish? It well, looks it, to me that like, you know, like all that stuff 
that was and, done, the lockdowns, it was just chaos. You just, and, they just devastated people's lives, jacked them with all these, these drugs. And now it's like, man, and you, and accomplished nothing. In New Zealand, it accomplished We're not in New Zealand. zero. We're in, in New Zealand, all this shutdown and everything else accomplished a, practically a, 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 a extraordinarily low infection rate, number one. Have you and seen their? Have you seen right now? Reopen, uh, reopen, and then they had to close down again because people came in and, and brought it back. Because everybody got COVID. I mean, the thing is, this <laughs> but, this, this but whole you thing understand is this. that the whole point of closing down is that businesses lose money, and that's why businesses don't want you to get vaccinated. Okay, enough enough said. Let's. Uh... Yeah, that's cool. uh, Doug, Doug Binkley, you got another question. Go ahead. Yeah, originally my question was going to be, uh, Brian, what about the polio coming back? And, uh, you know, would you, if you had uh, kids that you hadn't had vaccinated because you're such a libertarian, uh, would you maybe consider them getting the vaccine? But so I don't know if you're complete anti vaccine It appears you're not. You've got a sort of nuanced uh, bunch of arguments, but um, a lot of your stuff is falsehoods. I mean, most of the people that died of COVID died um, in uh, the or you know the original uh, time frame before the vaccines came out, and of course the the death uh, rate has gone down considerably since the vaccines have been at least used by like a majority of people. At least the majority of people I think maybe got two two uh, shots, although they should get four. It's a very complicated subject, and I don't want to get into it, but I did want to ask you um, about the uh, Second Amendment, and um, that it appears to apply to a militia, and it appears to not um, be explicit in giving rights to individuals. It it refers to a militia, and um, it's also incorrect. and also also about the statistics, which you you kind of glossed over. You didn't want to accept the science um, of history. The lessons of history and science are that. When the uh, ban on uh, assault weapons came in in the Clinton administration, and from there to the time when it was allowed to sunset by the George W. Bush administration, the number of mass killings went down considerably. And you can look that up, and that's just a point of record. So if you'd respond at least to that part. Okay, of, uh, sure. The fact that you, you just went over that and you didn't even mention that. Okay, sure. So, so what they say right this is this is the going political narrative right is that you know because of these laws right so what they're doing is equating correlation with causation so so if i don't even know if, if what they're saying is true i don't trust what they say but i'll assume science is correlation okay, sir I, I will assume for sake of argument that the, the rate of mass shootings dropped during that period. And then it increased when the sunset occurred. So I, I would say this, that's a correlation. That's not a causation. It doesn't mean that that law is what <coughs> caused those mass shootings to decline. The mass shootings could have declined for any number of reasons. One is that they redefined what a mass shooting is, right? So there's, you know, I believe the current definition is it, it, four people at one time is what constitutes a mass shooting or a school shooting. So there's definitions. So a school shooting is take, for example, right? They say, you know, this is a school shooting, right? So a school shooting would be, as it's defined, that someone gets into an argument with their girlfriend on, on a college campus, and then they go get a gun and they come back and they shoot her, right? That's a school shooting. So, so when they say school shootings, mass shootings declined, you know, the reason could be that they redefined what a mass shooting is. What another reason uh, could be that the that the economy was very good, that people weren't not, upset, crime rates go nonsense. down when the economy's good. So, total so it, it's you're talking about. So, so there's a there's a a Simpsons episode in which in which Homer oh, Simpson is, is, is talking about the the bear patrol 
Like he sees a bear in Springfield and it's like, oh my God, we need to get the bear patrol. So they start raise a bunch of taxes, hire a bunch of cops. They got helicopters going around looking for bears. And then he's like, wow, the bear patrol really worked out great. There's no bears around here. But the reality is there were there was a one, there was a fluke. It was one time a bear came into town and there's no bears because there were no bears in the first place. It was just this fluke accident. So so it's like, you know, but to Homer Simpson, he's like, hey, the bear patrol is working great. And so when, when they talk about, oh, this law prevented all these mass shootings, that's correlation, not causation. I question the validity of, the, of that statement. That's ridiculous. Yeah, well we could do, we could do the experiment again and we'll see okay but let's let's try hey, let's, let's, hey, try let's, let's just take everybody's rights let's away try something see. that worked before and try it again no, yeah. no, no, no. you're saying it that makes worked. a lot of sense hey, to me you're saying it worked isn't proof that it worked i want to oh. see a study that coral that that shows causation not just some statement that says oh mass shootings went down why why did mass shootings go down why what what is a reason other than your stupid law it wasn't stupid. You're stupid. <laughs> okay. Doug, you got to stop it. Yeah. That's more on. All right. Why don't we uh, argue with these kind of people? All right, all right, why don't we go to rebuttals, folks? I, Dan, I, let's I, go I to, think you're right. Let's go to rebuttals. don't accept science. People don't What's accept science. science you, you didn't present logic. any science. You didn't present any science. Oh, we presented theory. Uh, I it think science. It's now, it's now time for rebuttals. Let's. Uh, who's got a rebuttal tonight? Raj, you got a rebuttal? Yes. Okay. Who else? I know Charlie's got one. Okay, so we got drug, Margaret. We got Charlie. We got Raj. I don't want to go first. <laughs> oh, you're not going. <laughs> All right. Well, we got. Okay. I'll go with the three of you guys. Uh, Raj. Uh, and then uh, Margaret, and then Charlie, Bob, Matter, you want to go first? Okay. All right, here's the order. Raj, you'll go first. And then Margaret, I mean, I'm sorry, then then we'll go with Bob, and then Margaret, and then, uh, and then we'll do Charlie. Okay, so Raj, go ahead. Thank you. Brian, thank you. Okay, you're you very knowledgeable. And uh, you give it great presentation. The, in a way, law works in the United States. We got too many, you are right, we have too many laws, and we have too many people, and we have too many crimes, and too many court cases. So I, I don't think, uh, in a way, everything going is yeah. going to change. You know, oh, however, right. I'm on uh, mute. Am I on? Am I there? Yes, Hello. you are. Okay. Yeah, Raj. Uh, and um, so I do not I do not know what is the what is the solution. But uh, judges, we we can have a government uh, bring a lot less cases and uh, reduce the lodge that they can do it. City council can do it. Reduce the lodge and. Uh, Let's see what happened. And um, as far as uh, the other big discussion we had on uh, COVID, and uh, you, you you come from a different different perspective. My 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 one feeling is that if I need a lawyer, I go to lawyer. Okay, I'm not going to be my own lawyer, even though I have been in the past, because a uh, lawyer knows the laws, I know the logic, and logic doesn't work in a court what law is that works okay if i'm if i'm sick i'm going to go to doctor even though i might have some idea because i take advice of doctor now when a, when a, such a national issue happens like covid and other uh, other pandemic i think united states government health department is a best suited to make a decision and i respect them because because uh, they are doing a good job. Now, everything, every time I go, I have gone to a doctor and he gave me wrong drug, it had happened. Second time, I, I, I was in hospital and uh, 
the his, the one doctor signed that I'm to be released in the morning, and a second doctor uh, did not sign it. Went home. So things are going to happen. I system is not going to be perfect. I'm an engineer and I, I work in a steel mill. And every time we change the change the furnace lining, we were so particular, so much concern. The superintendent stayed whole two nights there and did not leave. So the things are perfect. But thing going problem going to happen. But the, the formula you are suggesting that well, we do not know history long enough. And Margaret is like right. We do not know history of most of the thing. We do lots of things. We do not know the history long enough. We do, you know, in the law, same thing happened. You know, and when we know history, we ignore it, like Supreme Court did on Everson cases. So to, for your insistence, any any that we have to have a long history and a proof that it works, that's invalid. That 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 is not the way society works, any society works. If that is true, then we would not be sending a um, Men to the Mars, so trying to send men to the Mars and send moon and go to other planets all the way. We do, we do, we do not, we take a chance. In America, we are an innovative society. We take chance, we innovate, we take a risk, okay? And we move forward. And do you know, America had done more research than any other country because we take a risk. Okay. And that is important to understand how society works. <clears throat> what is our strength, what is our weaknesses, and if you ignore those particular things, then we cannot progress. We'll start like many other countries. So, so to take a risk is an important part of the American culture and American growth. Thank you. Okay, Raj. Um, Bob Matter, you're going to go next. I'm going to give you four minutes. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, so I just, um, I'm glad you, uh, I think later on in your speech, you cleared up a a little misstatement you made when you, you you did mention at first that blacks uh, weren't allowed to vote until uh, 1970, but I, I'm sure you meant 1870 for black men and 1920 for black females. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if maybe maybe we should reconsider that female vote. Um, again, I mean, the women perhaps might be too emotional <laughs> uh, to uh, properly cast a ballot, I'm starting to think. Uh, also, uh, uh, the Georgia law about giving water in in uh, in voting lines. So that was intended to stop electioneering. You know, they don't. You can't give water or food to anybody in a line, and you can't really do anything within you know so many feet of an election line. Uh, it doesn't pre prevent people from getting water from an unattended receptacle. And a poll worker is allowed to give you water, but they didn't want electioneering going on with, uh, you know, people coming over to give you uh, water and a box lunch with a, with a big Democratic sticker on it or things like that. So uh, that's what that was all about. Uh, as far as the assault weapon ban, yeah, the jury's still out. Whether it was was there any, uh, uh, you know, uh, was that correlation or causation? To me, the chart of the of the time period involved from ninety four to two thousand four, the chart doesn't look much different than the previous ten years chart, although it's a little little the bar is a little taller in the in the in the ninety four to two thousand four part. Uh, the the spike the one spike year they had. Uh, with with uh, mass shootings, um, probably okay, probably could be due to due, uh, to population or something like that. Uh, I think probably what is more dangerous uh, right now and in, in, in the last several years is the gun sale, like the you know the alarming number of gun sales because people feel they have to arm themselves because our uh, states attorneys are no longer putting people away uh, in, in these dangerous uh, dem democratically controlled cities like New York and Chicago, you know, San Francisco, LA, et cetera. Um, it's the, you know, the crime rates really off the charts. And I did, I did see a, I didn't read it in detail, but I did see a brief blurb today that the civilian 
the murder rate in the United States now is higher than the civilians being killed in the Ukraine. So, so this is a real problem. And I'll tell you, Illinois has got the problem and Indiana has a, has a similar legislative problem, I believe, but you know, in Illinois, apparently there's no way to get rid of Kim Fox or any of these other rogue Soros district attorneys that are uh, refusing to put people in, in jail uh, for serious crimes. Uh, and, and it looks like Indiana, we might have the, we might have like a similar situation, uh, similar, uh, you know, uh, laws, but uh, I don't think we have the, the extent of, uh, you know, people like Kim Fox or at least cities with the crime rate. There are, there are some areas I know, well, at least there's one area where, where there's a, uh, a lenient uh, DA, but uh, so anyway, that's, that's a concern. And uh, I got to straighten Doug out here on the, if you're okay, still Bob, around, almost up. what's that? Your time Time's almost. Up. Yeah, it's up now. As a matter of fact. Oh, I wanted to just straighten drug dug out on the for, on the Second Amendment. The uh, it's not just for a militia. You'll notice that it says the right of the of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That means the right already existed before. The Constitution. This goes all the way back to English law. We've always had the ability to defend ourselves. That is an inalienable right that we have. It's our first and foremost right of self-defense. And it said, you know, now we do need a, you know, we have to be able to have a militia, but uh, to protect ourselves from standing armies of governments who tend to be criminals. But uh, that right, the right, shall not be infringed meaning that right we already had. Now we is can it, also uh, use that. Is this person, uh, are you actually Bob Matter? Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't know what you looked like. I sent you a direct message in the chat. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's move on. okay. Let's move on to our next three butter. Uh, Doug, I'm going to let you go next. Okay. Well, I Four just want to, yeah, <clears throat> I probably won't use that much. Um, Brian is a libertarian. Uh, I might say libertine, <laughs> but uh, it, libertarianism, of course, is selfishness. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, kind of an attitude that's, you know, hopefully will go away uh, as we begin to make progress to a better society. But uh, uh, I, I do, you know, I, I don't want to be complete. I don't want to beat him up completely. I guess. Um, I guess he made a point about the uh, uh, thing about the, you know, I, I do accept the fact that people ought to be able to defend themselves if they have a legitimate thought that they might be endangered and uh, have a gun for self-defense in their, in their home, which is the Heller decision, actually part of the Supreme uh, court. Uh, uh, and it's only recently that uh, the Supreme court has seemed to go along with these, this crazy idea that you can have these, more powerful weapons. I mean, now Brian even admitted that people shouldn't have, um, you know, nukes <laughs> in their backyard or whatever, a missile they could fire at their neighbors, you know, that would, <laughs> or, or a neighboring city and blow up a neighboring city or something like that. Or, or, or I suppose some of those guys that uh, are on his side that attacked the government um, on January 6th, he would prefer that they wouldn't have a nuke to destroy the capital. Um, so I did, he did draw the line. So um, obviously the line is somewhere in the middle. Um, and uh, we would hope that we could get to a place where um, it would be more reasonable. And uh, the evidence is in, I mean, um, uh, Margaret mentioned New Zealand, it's quite clear, um, and Australia, which uh, very much um, almost eliminated completely uh, assault weapons. And since then they've had virtually no um, mass shootings. Um, so the, the evidence is there, if not here completely to satisfy Brian, the evidence is there uh, from other countries. So it really is in, the science is there. Uh, if, uh, you know, most libertarians hopefully will not reject science totally. Um, I'm glad that Brian admits the smallpox vaccine is fine. Uh, he has a problem with um, a newer uh, type of vaccine, but uh, the fact is that uh, uh, vaccinations do work. 
Rome. And the problem is with these variants because not enough people are vaccinated. This is a scientific fact. You can look it up in textbooks. You can look it up. You can analyze it yourself with your brain, uh, Brian, if you use it properly. Okay, I'm done. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, let's move on to uh, Margaret. You got four minutes. Okay, um, could you mute yourself, Tim? You got you were doing some crosstalk too. Oh, I, um, I'm sorry, my mother was in the room, and I'll try to mute myself. Go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just am going to reiterate what Doug said that there's a number of of um, it, it, when in international studies, there's a number of international studies that show that countries who really do ban assault weapons, their mass murder things go way, way down and to zero often. And so um, that's been the case, as he said, in New Zealand and Australia and, in, and a number of other places, England and, and whatever. So um, that's a lot more than just one case. So it, uh, the preponderance of evidence is on that. Um, second, in terms of, of um, mandatory vaccines, I mean, all of this is long term and I mean, long old stuff. I mean, it, Typhoid Mary tried to be, they tried to restrict her from uh, working as a cook so that she gave everybody typhoid because she was cooking and she didn't want it. And so finally they had to put her in jail or something. I don't even remember what they did to her, but there was a, uh, a big uh, hue and cry and there would be now, um, it, you know, because they, they, they were restricting her ability to make a living and um, she couldn't make a living if she couldn't cook because that was the only thing she knew how to do. But then she, everybody got sick where she cooked for. And typhoid is really not something to mess with in case you don't know. Um, and then I guess the, the, um, the Dobbs case, the abortion case is something that's very complicated, is complicated in the sense that all of, the, all of these women who are getting abortions are saying that their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, their decisions about their own welfare and their own bodies are something that they should be able to make. And that, um, that uh, Ted Cruz should not be in their vagina, essentially. And so, um, because these laws are being mostly made by men and male, dominated legislators, legislatures. So um, I, so it has to do with somebody who's saying that life is sacred from birth versus the actual 3000 years of social experience that know indeed that people didn't, including the Catholic church, didn't accept that, that uh, life was sacred at birth, that it was after quickening when the woman um, decided that she was pregnant and that's as she announced it. Before that, it wasn't anybody's business. So, um, you know, that, so that's 3000 years of stuff. So uh, whether that belief or the religious belief of the Supreme Court justices, the six who are ideological extreme Catholic uh, people who are imposing their beliefs about religious beliefs about what abortion is and should be, and, and uh, what, when the fetus and embryo and, and the fertilized egg have a right to life, imposing those religious beliefs on everybody. So um, that's the end of my statement. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret, uh, for letting me go. And uh, Jan, I'm going to let you go before Charlie. So go ahead, Jan. Uh, you're next with your rebuttal. Oh, I I just wanted to uh, reaffirm what Margaret said about typhoid Mary. That was what I was going to bring up that I uh, forgot about when um, uh, when Brian was talking. This was a nice lady. She was, I, I mean, she got the name typhoid maybe late. Typhoid Mary is a shame because she was uh, 
she, she was a good person. She did not understand the germ theory at all had no concept of it and wouldn't believe it. And um, so she, and she also, you know, she didn't know enough to wash her hands. And um, when they told her she had to wash her hands, she just didn't get it. So uh, I wanted to bring up the case of typhoid Mary. I don't remember what they did with her, but um, uh, it would have been- Put her on an island. Put her on an island. Oh, well, anyway, it would have been much better for uh, culture and society if they had just given her a living and told her that she couldn't work uh, in a kitchen um, because she was not a bad person. She just she was a murderess. She murdered all right, a bunch Doug, of people. Uh, Doug, I'm sure that uh, you know all about it, and I will now retire. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, Charlie, uh, I guess we're going to have to let you, we are ready with your uh, ravings for the next four minutes, so go ahead. All right, first of all, I'd like to thank Brian for the research he did into the various constitutional issues. Uh, very interesting presentation. Okay, I'll be eclectic as here. Regarding the EPA, the way it works, Congress passes laws, which are often written very generically very simply, and then the agencies of the government come along and issue regulations. All they determined was, was that in one instance, the EPA exceeded its authority under the law to issue regulations. The other agencies are all continuing to operate as they always have, issuing regulations. That's the way, it's just like OSHA will say, there should be a safe workplace, OSHA comes along and issues all kinds of regulations on what exactly that means. So that really doesn't deter anything in any great extent. Number two, this notion of private sector food inspection is beyond comprehension. Uh, that we're gonna have Joe's Food Inspection Service in charge of this, some private sector subject to bribery uh, operating uh, the food and the food industry of the United States. I, I'm sorry, that's not going to work. This notion here that there are too many laws is fundamentally ridiculous, especially today, given electronic research, fine law and what have you into legislation. There are only 15 labor laws that apply, and this is really stretching it, that apply to the workplace in the United States, only 15. And to say that that's too many, are you kidding me? You, on what basis? In comparison to what goes on? And there's too few? My God, it's unbelievable. Regarding gun control, this I love this solution to gun control. He wants to have massive Massive social engineering. We're going to redo the American society so that some my loony neighbor can own guns. Uh, I and I like this here. We're going to have massive social engineering, but anybody has the right to refuse social engineering. Well, that's going to be a bit of a problem here. And this notion of frontal lobotomies. City clinical site doesn't know as they talked about that in decades. I don't know where did you get that bit of nonsense? Um, regarding the employer imposing rules while you have a job, it, it happened very specifically. Yes, the employer can do so all the time. I negotiate these changes, it's called a change in the conditions of employment. I negotiate those all the time. I get copies of them for review every day, look them over. Some we agree with, others we don't. So the classic one was drug testing. They came along and said, no, you, if you have certain employees uh, are going to require to periodically subject to random drug testing. Um, now, the last one is this requirement that there be no, now here's a fact, here's a pandemic killing a million people and 
ambulances up and down the block outside of the hospital. Uh, nursing homes, it's sweeping through nursing homes. The senior population going in, in massive numbers. And he says, oh, we got to that. We don't, we need long-term data. <laughs> well, that's when, 10 years from now? Come on, man. Oh, we don't have, we need long, listen, people are scrambling to get that vaccine when it came out. Anyone with a, a brain and intellect knew that this was approved and get vaccinated. Uh, oh, well, like, he's going to, yeah, in 20, 2032, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to have vaccinations. Uh, I, I don't understand some of these counter proposals. I think they need a little working at. Anyhow, thanks for your, your presentation. Hope you come again and give us another one. Thanks, buddy. Okay, uh, Brian, you got final. Uh, Jake, did you want to do a rebuttal? Jake, your hands up. Did you want to do a rebuttal? Jake. I don't think that's Jake. Who's who's on the phone? It's a, a six. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, that is Jake. Okay. Yeah, right. I just, I just. Okay, I just wanted to say one of this latest mass shooting in Highland Park. It turned out, it turned out that the kid's father gave him the gun. He didn't just go out and buy it. He was given it to. He either gave him the gun or gave or or signed on to the FOIA card so that he could get the get the gun. His his father his father supported him in it, even though he knew that in that he had a had a past history of uh, mental illness or hysteria or something. I can't remember what it was. There was one incident before then that uh, perhaps perhaps the general public wasn't aware of, but his family certainly was a, uh, was aware of. And yet his father signed on to the uh, gun application card. Okay, is that I, it? I don't understand. Yeah, okay. so, I mean... You know, we we don't, we need we need we need strong we need strong we need to ban assault weapons and we need stronger laws to ensure that guns don't go into the wrong hands. Okay, uh, Brian, you get the last remarks then. So go ahead. So, kind of listening to all you guys. I mean, it's just uh, you know, I mean. My my concern for the direction of the country has not been allayed by listening to you guys, uh, and, and and the reason I say that, and, and it's not like, and look, I, I'm not saying that you're unreasonable in in what you believe or or the positions you take. I, I mean, there are real social issues that we face, and these, you know, somebody just grabbing a rifle and just killing people—that's insane. I, I I can't believe that we will we live in a world where that happens on such a regular basis. And I wonder why, why are people making this choice? Why, why are people making the decision to take, take another person's life? That's, that's contrary to human nature, that as human beings, we are by nature cooperative. The idea of taking a life is repugnant to the normal person. And, and so why do we live in this world where we have so many shootings and so many murders and so and, and such callous disregard for the life of others? So I would venture to say, and I will again, you know, kind of look at to John Adams and, and what he said and, and what the, the larger point to what he said was there's a reason why we take the the we value the rights of the innocent above convicting the guilty. And it's because if you convict an innocent person, you take their rights from them. And when they haven't done anything wrong, then they are going to look at the law with disdain. And they're going to say, it doesn't matter if I follow the law, I'm gonna be punished regardless. And, and so by passing these laws in which you are taking people's rights from them, 
in a process in which they don't even they don't even know it's happening. There's a secret tribunal in, in which it's decided that a person's rights are to be removed from them. And that person doesn't have representation. They, they don't know what's happening. And, and so what kind of effect do you think that it's going to have on that person who sits there and says, I didn't even do anything. This, this person went in there and lied. It, like, what, what do you think is going to be the effect on that innocent person whose rights were violated, taken from them? Do you think they're going to look and say, I, I need to follow all the laws that it is so important that I follow the laws when when they were following the laws and it didn't matter, their rights were taken from them. You know, you know, you you're shaking your head there, Charlie. <clears throat> so so to to my pinko friends and I won't mention any names, it, you know, who 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 view due process and the presumption of innocence with disdain. I will only say that there's a there's a basic concept at play here, and it is do unto others as they would as you would have them do unto you. And so, when when you think you claim the authority to just accuse somebody, they're 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 you know they're doing something. They they're they're in a poor mental state. So I'm going to accuse them of being dangerous and have their rights stripped from them. Well, when that happens and when you agree with that kind of thing, don't be surprised when that turns around and comes right back at you. And so when it comes to people's right to get an abortion, you wonder why people's right to get an abortion was taken away from them. Well, in our country, we just, we, we clamor to take each other's rights away. That's, that's what we do. I mean, we got the Democrats want to take away every right we have. We got the Republicans talk about law and order and authoritarianism. That the solution to all our problems is just locking up more people in cages, giving the government the authority to just come in and take their rights away with no due process of law. Like this is the solution that the Democrats and Republicans present to us. And then we're supposed to decide whether these ideas are good or bad. And, and, and I would say to you that almost every one of these ideas is terrible because it doesn't address the root cause of the problem, which is why are people killing each other? This is fundamentally the problem. Be and, and, and they talk about you know, your right to life, right? <clears throat> oh, what, what right to, to life do you have, right? So, so I look at that and, and say, OK, so I think any reasonable person with with some cognitive ability will recognize that the war on drugs, right, is what creates mm -hmm. this. The prohibition creates these gangs because of the financial incentive to sell drugs. There's tons of money in it. So the prohibition means that the, the people engaged in that activity can't use the courts. They can't use the courts. So because it's illegal. So they're left with one option. If, if somebody robs them, they can't, you know, somebody steals their, their product. They can't go to court. They can't call the police. They're left with one option, street justice. So, so as I live in this city where, where street justice is so commonplace and the street justice, the, the need for it is caused by the war on drugs, when I say, when I think about people's right to life, I say, end the war on drugs. This is a failed policy. It has been failed for 50 years. It's, it's causing overdoses. It's causing hardcore addiction problems that go unaddressed. And yet we keep these laws in effect, right? Because we're afraid of the world and people can choose which substances they use to inebriate themselves. So, you know, so if you're so worried about life, right, you're so worried about gun violence, then, then you should be lobbying for the end of the drug war and, and rather than trying to take people's rights away. And, and which is fundamentally the problem is that every time we have an issue in this society, the solution is to take people's rights away. And it's not to try to address the underlying problem that causes these issues. So these red flag laws are a Band-Aid. They will not solve the problem. They, you know, Illinois has a red flag law. In effect, the, the guy in Highland Park, somebody could have red flagged that dude. They didn't. The, the, the law is already here. 
the law failed. So, so your solution is what? Expand the law? Take more rights away from people? Yeah, and I know, Charlie. I know that's your, that's your solution to everything. So, so here we go. I, I mean, this is so, so I'm glad for federalism. I'm glad for the Supreme Court turning some of these issues back to the states so that I can leave and I don't have to be subjected to this, you know, just tyranny. So, because I'll go to another state and then you, and, and then the people of Illinois can, can just, you know, red well, flag please, law each other and get emergency say, orders of protection and take everybody's say. rights away for safety. Thank you. Please say, Brian. We Thank need you. Thank you, Brian. I I, I appreciate your. I really do appreciate almost everything that you said. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I I understand, right? I'm not not a patently unreasonable person. I get it. I, I mean, it's just we just disagree on the solutions here. I, I mean, you know, look, I I understand the problem and the need to address them. I I disagree about the solutions. The solution is almost never to take people's rights away. Brian, 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 as a as a libertarian, you're starting to sound like Ken Fox. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, I ran. I, ran I, I voted. Fox. I voted for. I voted. I voted for Ken Fox once. Once was enough. She came up for re-election. I voted for someone. Someone else. Um, and if me? you Bob, I'm uh, Bob. No, Bob. If you no. if you notice, <laughs> Bob. If you you weren't on the ballot, Bob. If you if you if if you noticed within the last week, there were several uh, several career uh, lawyers and prosecutors from that office who walked out on her, uh, saying that saying that she's essentially in, incompetent. So so look, I ran against so, Kim Fox right in this last election. I was on the ballot, and I got really I got, really well, yeah. I got, I got 150,000 votes and but wait, wait, you were on the, you're on the, you're on the, you're on the ballot. Where? In Cook County. I ran against Kim Fox. As what? And what, 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 what party? For state's attorney as a, as a libertarian. Oh, so you're, you're saying, you're <laughs> saying, um, you, you're saying two years ago you ran against her as a libertarian. Yeah. So it, oh, well, that, this, that, that, invited, that explains it. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I don't criticize her and, and I declare okay. I'm not going to I'm right. not going to criticize Kim Fox. And the, re, and the reason I'm not going to criticize Kim Fox as somebody who ran against her is because I imagined myself in that seat. I imagined having to make the same decisions that she's she does. And, and I know yeah. that I don't have all the same information she does. So yeah. as, I, as I look at her policies, right, so under Kim Fox, right, prior to the, the year of the election in which she had the Black Lives Matter pro protests, the, the, you know, so many people. All right, Jake and Brian, real quick, before we go further, I'm going to terminate the uh, official recording tonight, and I'll let you guys continue on after Zoom. Would that be okay. acceptable at this okay. point? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Gonna, because okay. I'm going to turn the hosting controls over to Brian on the okay. Zoom call after this. I don't so, want to be in control, man. Don't be put. Don't be putting me in charge. I don't want to be in charge. We're, we're going to be doing. Well, who wants to take the? Who wants to take the host controls? Because I got to leave for a little while. All right, Charlie. I'm going to put them in, uh, yeah. in your hands. Oh, no, no, I, I don't. All right, all right. Brian, just, 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 just okay. Just to continue. To continue. All right. Now continue. we're going to. What were you saying? Recording. We're stopping the recording now. Okay. Thanks okay. For okay.